So I will start again. So, um, well, welcome to the Plants and Patents Symposium. Thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Graduate School of Experimental Plant Sciences for hosting this webinar. Uh, my colleagues at Gene Sprout for helping in the organization. Uh, the exceptional speakers that we were able to gather here today, uh, including the panel, which will be partly online, and of course the audience in person and uh, online. So um, I would like to give you a small welcome and introduction to the topic. Mostly actually by giving you a teaser, um, also to understand, uh, you know, uh, what are really the topics that triggered us into starting this discussion uh, today and having intellectual property also had, at the heart of the mission of uh, Gene Sprout uh, Initiative today. Um, mm -mm. Technical problem. <laughs> uh. Okay, okay. So today what we want to promote is an open dialogue on intellectual property in plants. Uh, we want to target plant science students and early career researchers to develop a critical understanding on the topic of intellectual property in plants. And we want to do this today by listening to uh, stakeholders that we have guarded. But first I want to introduce uh, who is Genesprot Initiative. So we are a group of uh, early career plant scientists from around Europe who gathered in 2018. We came together after the ruling of the European Court of Justice on new genomic techniques, meaning genome editing, uh, like uh, CRISPR-Cas9 techniques. When the Court of Justice uh, ruled that, that uh, new genomic, uh, that crops produced with new genomic techniques are subject to GMO regulations because of the lack of a history of safe use. In G-Sprout, we felt that this could largely impact early career, young, uh, early career scientists uh, because of funding withdrawn from, uh, from research, because of career and research opportunities moving abroad and outside of Europe, and because it was very disheartening for many of us young scientists understanding that their research couldn't be used for actual impact um, in Europe. We also felt that uh, early career scientists didn't uh, sit at the decision-making table and their opinion was not considered. Um, and we also felt uh, as community of young scientists responsible for the miscommunication with the public about new uh, genomic techniques. And this is why uh, GSPR initiative, what we do is we want to inform society uh, on new genomic techniques and plant breeding in plants uh, in general. We want to stimulate an open dialogue with the public. We want to give voice to early career researchers and plant science students, and also to be engaged uh, in uh, uh, policy and advocacy at the European level. Uh, where do we do this? Well, we do this with events uh, in person and hosting seminars and symposiums like this one. We do it by moderating debates uh, and also with uh, a number of webinars online. We do this on the socials. You can find us on a number of socials. Here is our Instagram, for instance, uh, where we tell stories and fun facts about plants and make people comfortable and uh, uh, you know learn about plant breeding and sciences in general. And we also have a number of resources on our website Website, like small games uh, to learn about plant breeding. So, uh, but uh, the topic of today is plant patents and NGTs. NGTs, with that we mean new genomic techniques. And it might sound already a quite confusing jargon for some, but with new genomic techniques, the European Commission means uh, techniques capable to change the genetic material of an organism that have emerged since 2001. And 2001 is um, when the uh, GMO directive dates back to. Uh, so with that, basically, we mean genome editing techniques like uh, CRISPR-Cas, for instance. And why the reason why this is at the center of the attention politically is that uh, the legislation is deemed not anymore fit for purpose. And this is important because we need uh, to have a future-proof legislation if we want uh, to leverage any possible tool for the plant for plant breeding in order to attain the goals of the European Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy. And this is clearly mentioned by the European Commission study on new genomic techniques as well. So this is why this topic jump, jumped up on top of the European Commission agenda that has currently a timeline uh, that started back this uh, from actually April 2021 uh, from with the 
with the uh, with the, the release of uh, um, of the study on new genomic techniques of the European Commission, and that will end will come up with eventually a set of policy options to come up with a legislative proposal. So as at Genesport, we have been engaged in several of these steps of this current timeline, starting from the European Commission study, in which we released our open letter uh, to the study, which you can find by screening this, uh, this code. We have participated in person and as a group to the Have Your Say consultation, alongside any, uh, many other respondents. Uh, we were there with our found, founder, Nikita, at the high-level event organized by the European Commission. We will be um, consulted as stakeholders uh, for the impact assessment that the Commission um, is, is preparing. And uh, right now, uh, there is an active public consultation that you can also participate to as individuals, which will be open uh, until the beginning of July, and we are also participating to that. So, uh, well, but it is not just about Europe. We have been seeing in the past months, in the past week, a numbers a number of um, international policy developments on genome editing, starting from African countries changing the legislation uh, to use uh, genome editing in their countries. Um, UK, uh, the first uh, uh, CRISPR edited tomato that goes uh, commercially sold on the market uh, for the first time. Uh, Belgium with field trials with genome editing techniques. And this is, you can see the, you can see the dates here is just very, very recent news. Breaking news, India and China, just to name, just to, to name a few. And you can find more also uh, of these stories uh, of our, on our socials in which we try to monitor what are the international policy developments. But we have been hearing breaking news also connected with the intellectual properties on new genomic techniques. During the opening of the academic year, uh, Luis Fresco and Professor John van der Oost announced that the CRISPR patents at Wageningen University would be given uh, for free for no-profit applications in plants. And this was a breaking news for us and very important as, um, as actually this highlights how the access to technologies and genetic material is also at the core of the new genomic techniques uh, policy landscape as this is essential to be able, um, in order for these techniques to deliver on the targets for sustainable impact uh, that we actually want them to deliver on. Uh, and also it highlighted how the intellectual property landscape around these techniques can greatly impact the public accept acceptance of new genomic techniques, uh, which in GSPROD we deeply care about. But then uh, just to do a step back, what do we mean with intellectual property in plants? Well, intellectual property, they are exclusive rights of commercialization. Uh, and we have two different systems um, interplaying uh, the level of plants. We have uh, patents, uh, which apply to any uh, technology and innovation, um, required that it is uh, required that it is novel, non-obvious, and that it has an industrial application. And it is 20, it, it has a duration of 20 years. And a number of things can be patented in a plant, things like a trait, plants with recombinant genes or methods and techniques to produce a plant with recombinant genes. But at the European level, we also know uh, that uh, the law says that essentially biological products and processes cannot be patented. And this is why in the case of plant varieties, we have another system, which, which are plant breeders rights, which concern plant variety as a whole have a duration of 25 to 30 years and extend through rounds of propagation of the variety. However, when we speak about new genomic techniques, still a clarification is lacking uh, about uh, exactly where uh, plants produced with new genomic techniques would fall into this uh, twofold system. And we hope that uh, the panel today will help uh, us clarify that as well. So, um, but, Okay, why plant breeders' rights? What is great about plant breeders' rights? Well, there are these two things called privileges, one concerning breeders and one concerning farmers. One is the breeder exemption that creates a sort of open source like model around plant varieties in which if I am a breeder, for instance, I can use the material of another breeder to create uh, a new variety. Um, on the other hand, this, uh, there is also a privilege for farmers called the farmer safe seed um, that uh, in which farmers can propagate uh, seeds on their field and are charged nothing uh, or uh, very little even when the variety is protected. But 
uh, there is a fundamental debate also on this aspect because this is not taking place in many countries. And uh, we will be asking uh, some questions uh, about that also to our panel. But um, another breaking news concerning plant breeding, uh, plant breeders' rights is actually that this past uh, April, um, so just uh, two months ago, um, a study was released uh, with a few voices of impact uh, of the plant breeders' rights system in Europe. Um, and that reported, which was very surprising for us, that 93% of plant breeder rights owner in the European Union are actually small breeders. They are small and medium enterprises. And this was very surprising for us, as we often think that intellectual property is something that concerns mostly, usually the large industry players. Uh, the study also reported that without uh, the plant breeders' rights system, the production of arable crops, for instance, would be 6.4% lower, and similarly for other crops as well. Uh, it was also uh, reported, estimated in the, in the study, that um, the plant breeders' rights system uh, is able to cut the agricultural emissions uh, of about 60, uh, 62 million tons uh, per year. But actually, um, there is also a very complicated and crowded uh, space uh, concerning uh, the patent landscape that is around the CRISPR-Cas9, um, which makes it very difficult for players to actually play into this landscape with more than 6,000 CRISPR patents uh, that, that actually populate this space and about 200 that enter uh, every month uh, concerning patents and patent applications. And it is not just a very intricate landscape of patents uh, and complex, but it is also very uncertain. As we know that there is uh, about the, uh, on the foundational CRISPR-Cas patent, uh, fundamental patent litigation, which turned more uh, in a patent war that uh, was estimated actually to have burned uh, in uh, from 2013 uh, up to this date, uh, about um, half a billion dollars from the different players involved. Um, and we still hear uh, news today of different uh, battles being won by one and the other side uh, of this litigation, actually. Um, and this crowded space uh, does not just concern uh, the fundamental uh, patents around CRISPR, but also actually uh, CRISPR patents in agriculture. Here we see, for instance, the network of uh, patent holders of uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, patents, in, uh, in plants and in agriculture, and the several licenses, so the several users, um, entities that are using uh, their patents uh, with the form of licenses. And this creates a very complex uh, web of licenses. And it poses, it helps us, um, well, it makes us ask if this would lead to more collaborations between different industrial players or more control because of um, you know, patents being in the hands of of a few. So um, then when, do we, when we have our plant, uh, we have understood that there, are, uh, there is the overlap of these two systems because a number of things uh, in plants can be protected, starting from traits, genes, techniques, and also the same variety. So the fundamental question that we would like to, uh, to ask today to our speakers uh, and to understand is if the advent of new genomic techniques will change this balance of this overlap of systems in plants, who will benefit and who will be affected. In JSTROT, we believe that new genomic techniques can address complex breeding targets in a timely and cost-effective manner. This is why we believe that uh, it is common understanding that uh, they can be affordable even for smaller players and that they can level the playing field for differently sized companies and even smaller labs. So what we want to understand today and to, um, well, to, to critically assess is if intellectual property, the intellectual property landscape around these techniques will support uh, this transition uh, or if we, it will hamper it. And for this, we will listen to the exceptional speakers that we have gathered here today. So, well, thank you for being here. Um, and even though I would welcome questions, I hope that this small presentation would just, was just a teaser because uh, these questions will be uh, best answered by the, the, the speakers and the experts that we have gathered here. 
Um, okay, now I will leave the floor to Patricia, who will introduce our first uh, speaker. Thanks, Helena, for a nice introduction. So today's first speaker is Dr. Suraj Yamge. Uh, Suraj obtained his PhD in plant molecular biology at Bahamingen University. And since 2019, he works as innovation manager at uh, Knowledge Transfer Office at Bahamingen University, where he scouts for innovative ideas and technologies and supports scientists in the world to map towards value creation. But uh, most importantly, Suraj also assists in IP protection, advises on valorization grants, and provides business intelligence uh, support to and today he's going to explain us how to create value with intellectual property. So, Suraj, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Let's bring this down. It's okay. Uh, thanks, Patricia, for the nice introduction, and uh, also Jean Sprout and the EPS for inviting us and having us on the program. It's a very nice um, place to be and also talk with fellow PhDs and master students and everybody who is online there as well. I am also a Wah I was a Wahanigan graduate, still a, uh, defended a few years ago, 2017, 2018. And since then, I uh, left academia, but still in academic environment and working at the knowledge transfer office uh, of the university or the value creation office, which is called. Um, my goal here is to also share how universities as an education system can support a knowledge transfer and what are the ways that they create value through knowledge. So I changed the title, but we will come to IP later on. Um, Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, as we know, uh, we as a knowledge institute have different roles to play, uh, primarily research and education, but there's a third pillar that becomes much more important, and that's what we call value creation or knowledge utilization. I just returned from a recent trip last week from India, and I did visit some educational in institutes there, but their, their roles are still very much pillared into one activity. But we are fortunate in Europe, in states, in other part of West, that we play quite different roles. And the third pillar, value creation, especially important because this is how we can actually bring our results to practice. And uh, this is what also Wahakani University does um, uh, prominently. So I will share a few next two slides on Wahakani. Um, so I work at the knowledge transfer office and it's we, chose consciously to name our department as well as value creation just after the third core task of the university. And uh, the, the department is clustered into four main clusters that we do knowledge transfer. This is where everything about how to bring our knowledge to practice happens. Uh, for the means, for the, for the part that doesn't goes through knowledge transfer, the, sometimes they are fit to go through the entrepreneurial part. So that's where the entrepreneurship comes in. But we, uh, our strategy and agenda is also to for finding answers together. So we also need a campus and an innovation ecosystem where we have our partners and stakeholders that can also add value to the knowledge that we create and we open up facilities for them. And there's also a knowledge for society part that we focus on. This just gives a little bit of inner working on how the department functions and it supports. It supports actually, so we don't work alone, but we support all the different faculty, the staffs, the five science groups that we have here, more than 6,000 employees and 2,000 PhD candidates that we have, plus the students. Um, and knowledge for society is also a very important pillar. And I'm happy that Jean Sprout takes this initiative to really have this dialogue. Uh, last year, or this year, we opened up the dialogue center that also runs such programs. So I would actually invite Jean Sprout to also engage in a long-term dialogue session on this relevant topic. So uh, talking about knowledge to impact, um, we did already hear from Elena a few times impact. What I actually like to share with you 
this is quite a long process. So it's not an individual task that uh, you are involved from the beginning to the end. In, in many uh, ways, you just cannot be. And if you look back to what has happened with um, climate change and the policies that have came in place and the solutions that are still waiting to be coming to the market, it has taken a long time for it to come. So direct uh, results and immediate uh, insights that you generate from your research programs the output that has led to change in behaviors, change in our relationships with different stakeholders and actions resulting to policy changes. And now we are there to see behavioral changes in maybe uh, reducing our emissions from eating less meat to really driving electric cars or finding different ways to reduce emissions. So what I want to say is it's a long and iterative process and you need a lot of support and a lot of different uh, efforts and a lot of different actors have to come in together. And this holds true also for the initiative of bringing uh, this CRISPR related technologies to, to marketplace. It's also a long road there. I was asked to share a few words on intellectual property um, because that's also one of the focus areas that um, um, our department supports. We do have a uh, patent experts, uh, as also in the crowd, I see Ruben is here, uh, but in the department that actually prominently help uh, researchers with the uh, uh, with IP related questions. Uh, so in general, intellectual property is a creation of human minds. Uh, and this creation could be inventions, um, literary work of art, design, images, logos. Uh, and these are uh, in form of intangible assets. And when you provide legal rights to this, uh, creation of minds, that's what we call that intellectual property rights. Uh, and Elena in her talk mentioned a few of those uh, intellectual property rights. There are many. Uh, they come from patents, copyrights, design rights, uh, trademark. I assume uh, Gene Sprout Mark, Gene Sprout label is a registered trademark. For instance, so is the Wageningen Unicet label. Database rights uh, and confidentiality or trade, trade secret. So there are different forms of intellectual property rights. And uh, they, how do you get rights? So there, for some, you need to register. Some are automatic. So patents that need to be filed, so that need to be registered. For trademarks, that's the case for design rights. But some, such as copyrights and database rights, uh, are automatic. And the durations are different based on what it is. What I didn't show here was the plant breeders' rights, because I know Mikhil is going to talk about it. The panel will speak, and you are also going to listen. But this is just to give you a snapshot on what intellectual property rights are. As we have seen, there is a, uh, you briefly also mentioned about the CRISPR uh, landscape. And I also wanted to mention here, um, so there is a growing influx of patented inventions. And this is also, a, there is a strong geological biases in this uh, patented invention. So you can see United States, China, and I think Europe comes in the uh, trails to the third place, the total of Europe. And this is just, this data is just until 2018, uh, the publication. So there's more than 6,000 patents every month. We see a huge number of patents being coming. But what is also interesting is to see where these patents are actually working on and what these patents are about. Uh, this, what I see is the field is still seeking for technological improvements of its own. So 45% of patents that are being filed, as per this study, shows technological improvements of the system as itself. The applications such as medical and plant use are comes comes in second place. Of, so they also take a big technology. There's also a lot of uh, uh, innovation happening there. But what is also interesting, if you look at this study and other studies, most of the CRISPR patents are prominently owned, like two thirds of it are owned by universities. So by educational institutes. So if you look at the patent and you find the inventors, you will find they are coming from universities. So that's also quite remarkable in this world. So this technology still is in hands of universities. Um, so how do knowledge institutes such as were or in general within Europe creates value through IP? Um, the one way I would like to bring it is to so really making the results work for society. And institutes such as Wageningen and many other institutes have IP policy in place that actually ensures how we make use of this uh, knowledge to, towards society. Uh, so we, have, we do also have an IP policy within our organization, but basically the principles behind IP is to sort of 
right before you start working on your projects, even if you're applying for an NW grant, there is sort of an emphasis on knowledge utilization. So even before you become your research activity, there is a focus on, okay, what kind of value can you add towards society? And this can be in form of IP as well. And then, uh, so the IP generation starts during the research of your um, uh, pro programs, research programs, followed by protection, then you can reach out to your university's offices. I, 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 I understand there are many users coming from different universities. So your universities also have support systems that can actually help you to protect and they manage and making sure how to best transfer this knowledge to the end use. But this is actually a complete circle uh, uh, in a way that talking about patent. So the patent starts with basically uh, when, you, when you have an invention disclosure, you make an invention disclosure early on, and then you seek for a patent protection if it's patentable. As a result of this patent, then there's a whole other amount of support that knowledge institutes have to put in to find commercial entities who would like to use this knowledge to bring products and services. And as a result of this, it can create revenues. And this revenues actually go into reinvesting of education and research. Part of these revenues are also shared for, uh, with the inventors who are the founders. And such a uh, such policy is actually a complete circle. So this can fund, fund further research and education. So this holds quite a value for our, ourselves also. There are many more routes uh, to create societal value. And uh, one of them that is often discussed also here within Europe is by bridging the role of academic spin outs and startups. So uh, research results can lead to innovative solutions uh, through uh, young startups and spin out activities, but these often require a lot of entrepreneurial skills and funding. And if you just look at the picture of uh, what's happening right now in Europe, more than 60% of startup founders from Europe are actually coming from the universities with masters and PhD degrees. Uh, just in 20, 19, the university spin-outs have attracted more than 4 billion of capital funding in those university spin-offs. So this is sort of a, and there is more uh, funding coming from the Euro European Innovation Council to foster such way of also bringing no knowledge to society. So of course I cannot, I had to mention also the CRISPR startups that are attracting also a lot of amount of uh, funding in this space. Uh, just until 2020, uh, more than 3.2 billion USD dollars was raised by CRISPR startups uh, in US uh, in cumulative uh, from this study at least. And uh, since the, in the last five years since starting, there's quite some companies have also reached to the initial public offering. So they have become listed companies. And if you look at where the funding is actually going, most of the funding that is attracted, the startups are working in a biomedical and R&D space. Uh, followed by industrial applications and biological research. There's a tiny amount of startups that are actually working on agriculture biotechnology. And this, I think, has to do with the leg legislations and regulations around, but this is still changing. So uh, just to give you also, since we are here, uh, there are a lot of agri-based uh, startups active. Some of them you might be aware. Um, Plantec, Pairwise, Agrain, also right in Wakhanigan, there's one Hood Center for Biotechnology. They're trying to all do use CRISPR in a different ways to bring fruits, vegetables, oil crops, different type, type of um, um, ways to bring sustainable food towards market. They're still in their infancy. Uh, we do have uh, our uh, Solenta coming up next. And uh, I don't know if they are using CRISPR yet. We'll, we'll hear about it. But there's a lot of activity happening in Ireland, in Netherlands, in Europe uh, with startup companies. Plantic is based, I think, in France, but quite some companies are all startup companies are prominently located in the uh, US or China. So the during ahead of the UN the UN Food System Summit, Wakanigan announced and made our own CRISPR Cas portfolios free for free licensing. And this actually falls into the socially responsible licensing realm. Why this is so relevant? Because we have seen in the wake of pandemic and also 
the whole discussion around making valuable medicines and medical de devices accessible. So the Dutch ministry actually asked the National Federation of the Medical Centers to, to come up with guidelines on how can we enable valuable medicines and medical devices uh, access at an affordable cost when it is needed in the urgency of need. And this resulted in development of socially responsible licensing principles, guidelines that are set for universities and uh, knowledge institutes to adapt and use that. And the decision that we did was also in line with those guidelines to really make accessible such crucial technology to markets, to regions in the global south where regional non-government organizations, non-profit organizations, research institutes can access this technology, develop crop needs that are fit for the local farmers and the users in the, for that specific region. So it, I think this was a phenomenal and a milestone decision. And we hope most of the universities step in and this socially responsible licensing is widely adopted. Um, this might change uh, the, the dynamics moving on, but that's a discussion for the panel. Uh, but there are many ways how uh, our university, but in general, you know, knowledge institutes and you can create value, societal value. I just mentioned a few here. And uh, I've listed all different ways that we engage with researchers within our universities. Some of them you do directly, uh, scientific impact by publishing relevant research. Um, but also uh, advising to policymakers, like what we have seen in the in the wake of pandemic, where direct measures were shared with um, to the Corona management team on how to uh, control crowds, how to uh, behave, how to um, um, bring in the necessary products and services towards market. And there are other ways how we can also create value, also dissemination of knowledge, sharing uh, relevant. Um, having a dialogue and a welcoming all different perspectives that we have here. So I would also ask you to continue having the, this dialogue and welcoming all different perspectives because I, don't, I still miss a lot of different stakeholders here. You could have farmers, you could have a wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, and I think it's a continued conversation. As I transition to a career, so before closing, I actually wanted to also share, since we have some master students and PhDs in the audience, a few things that you might also want to consider uh, yourself if you uh, want to grow in a, in a path towards uh, a non-academic career, also in your own careers. Uh, the WIPO uh, World International uh, Property uh, Organization runs a program called Youth Expert Program. It's a two years program where you can learn more about intellectual property, become a leader and work in the space of innovation. If are there any master students here or online, check out the Horizon Europe Young Observer Program. This is actually open for the whole year because we are celebrating the European Year of the Youth. And this is basically, if you're a math student, you can actually overlook how competitive funding is being evaluated, how you can participate and look at how the funding is being assessed, how it is allocated. It's a great learning opportunity. Somebody who would like to work in the tech transfer field or knowledge transfer office, there is actually a Life Arc funds fellowships every year. And this is a full year fellowship program that you can do while you're doing your PhD or a postdoc, and you can integrate into one of the offices of the universities and benefit from such fellowships. They will send you to all the different meetings, give you different courses. So it's also a nice place. And of course, at Wakhanigan Fund uh, University, within our institutes, we run a lot of different funds. Uh, for instance, the Mariana Fandama Award that helps you to further explore your career opportunities outside. Uh, your present research expertise, but also there are more than 27 opportunities that you can actually apply as a student, as an entrepreneur, as to pursue further research on a topic, uh, and also the own Road to Innovation grant that we have. So there's a lot of different positives, and I just wanted to share this, that check it out and help. And with that, I think I would like to thank, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions, and yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Suraj. So I just want to mention at this point that if there are any questions online, please type it in chat and we are gonna read it out to our speakers. And if there are any questions in the room, please uh, raise your hand and I'm gonna come to you. Any questions? Well, if not, I actually have one, maybe it's a bit 
interested to know what is your opinion because you showed us this nice graph with how many patents has been there in different countries and then of course in Europe we are very late uh, if we compare ourselves to US and so on but on the European ground Switzerland was the, the best one right with the number of uh, patents uh, uh, Sorry, the Switzerland grant, sorry. So the, the Switzerland had the highest number uh, of, of patents, right? Compared to every other country on European ground. Could so, be, uh, I don't know by heart what, what is the present status of uh, the Swiss patents, but if you also look at the publication, don't just look at patents, but if you also look at scientific publication, you would see this divide. So there's a lot of scientific research activity as well happening in the US in China, I think Germany comes in the third place uh, after US and China. So there's a difference in, uh, but I think you, the, the reason why you see a lot of activity there also, it's also protected there because that's also probably the biggest marketplace. So, and I think you can hear more how this works, but US and uh, China probably is also a bigger marketplace. So most of the, in general, when we see filing, uh, overall, not only for CRISPR, in general for broader technologies, those are where they are filed, those are where they are maintained because that's also where the market is for most of the technology, yeah. But also Europe is a bigger marketplace, yeah. Yes. Suhash, I have a question. Um, you, sh you said in the beginning that we should really think about uh, our IP or to reevaluate it at the beginning of our project. Um, and that's, well, it reminded me of uh, as scientists, we're usually, uh, you know, we want to share our work in conferences and stuff like that. But it sometimes can create a problem because then all that is there. So maybe you can explain a bit more how that works. Like, what should we come to do? And what are kind of the mistakes that we can make to maybe not get a problem? Yeah, no, thank you for asking, Urian. Uh, I would say come as early as possible. Just don't come the day before when you have publishing public paper is going online. So that's too late uh, because we often see, we have to make an invention disclosure. It doesn't stops you from sharing your research. Patenting doesn't stop you. It just helps you to, okay, protect it upfront and making aware, okay, what kind of disclosures you should do or not do because that can, because novelty is a criteria that is a sense of novelty, inventiveness and applicability, application. So to avoid novelty, you need to sort of come early and then make sure you don't disclose the invention itself early on. So even disclosing some information during the post publication and now everything is online hybrid, we, we, we do see later on then uh, there is the disclosure and then the novelty is destroyed. But in spite of patents, you can do, uh, you can turn intellectual property, there are different, through open ways, innovation, there are different ways of creation. So the answer is come to us early on, or come to talk to your colleagues. And also there are at your science group uh, experts who can advise you on that, or your professor can advise you on that as well. Yes, coming. Well, thanks for a nice presentation. Um, so as a PhD student or a master's student, we are always involved into the bigger context of our departments and we hardly make decisions by ourselves. So do you realize that also in your daily work that uh, you're more in touch with the head of the department or the professors rather than uh, younger scientists? Yeah, we actually talk. So me, I have a few more colleagues. So we are a department, a big department as well. So we often try to reach out to, uh, to colleagues, but we also reach out to uh, the, the professors at your group. Uh, we are often invited to at the department meetings to share. So for instance, Mark Hanigan has this Road to Innovation grant uh, that is meant specially for PhDs and employees of the university. So you can actually we are together with your PhD, try to see, okay, can I do other applications of this research? And this is actually fully funded internally by the department, uh, not, not by the department, but by the university, by the science group. Uh, so we, we do, but we, we do know there are more than 6,000 employees we have to reach. So we are still scratching the surface. And um, we are also now setting up a program where we can actually have uh, interns actually much more reaching out at individual departments. Yeah. And uh, we host training and uh, sessions uh, as well. And most of the information that I'm sharing uh, for Wakanigan audience, you can find on intranet. 
we share a lot on intranet there, but it is uh, not not visible. Yeah. Personally, I'm not from Wageningen, but yeah. I, I I just feel it's a it's a trend that these tasks are often left to the senior scientists, and that it's hard to get involved into this level of science as a junior scientist. Whereas I think all our departments would benefit a lot from us getting more involved. Yeah. Yes, our professors are overburdened with adding yeah. this. Yeah, and I think uh, EPS is also hosting some specific courses on uh, the importance of IP or intellectual property. So that's also it's a good way of learning on when to raise these questions to your boss as well. So ask your professors these questions. Hey, can we protect this? Or can we do something more? How do we bring it to pra practice? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you also for the presentation. I'm going back a bit to the previous uh, presentation where we shared this number of 93% of uh, small and uh, medium companies actually have the plant breeders rights. But how can a small company with the limitation of time and money, is it worth it? I guess that's the, the question. Is it worth for a small company due to all the limitations regarding IP to invest on it? I think we can hear that very well from a so small company in the next speaker, Mikhail can share uh, compared to the big companies. So I'm actually curious to hear more as well. So it would be perfect. So I'll leave this question to the next one. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering, with so many patents you know, being uh, granted in the CRISPR space, how, how would you advise a, a young entrepreneur to navigate this CRISPR space to figure out if what he's wanting to do would, would even be feasible with, with licensing issues? Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a bigger question to answer in a sh short time, but we really look at what the invention is. So... Uh, just have a conversation. And I don't know if you're from Wageningen or elsewhere. At the regional, at the national level also, there is support. So entrepreneurs can actually re reach out to RWO for advice on what they can do and what will be the strategy. Sometimes you don't need IP to start a business. You don't need IP to run an entrepreneurial venture. You can do it, but then you have to be more agile, trying to come uh, raise funding, be smart in how you do it as well. But yeah, you don't want to get into uh, litigations after all. So this is sort of a... But there are different ways to, to navigate this as well. So some are really complex, uh, but yeah, this is also, so we do advice and we have those conversations uh, early on with the entrepreneur and then advise them, okay, what he should do or not, what is feasible or not, yeah. I, I assume it must be quite uh, challenging to maintain an all view of everything that's, that's it, it going is, on. Yeah, it is, and it's all, it keeps on changing as well. And you should realize, I mean, there are 110 million patents in the patent, but not all are 80% of them, if I'm uh, if I recollect, are still out of patent protection. So they either they're not granted or they run their life. So there's amazing solutions out there that you can use, but then you still need to be aware of third party rights and not infringing other people's rights. So they, they, it's a, a broader uh, question. So, but we do have those conversations with our, uh, when it comes with the right team and experts on board, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just want to read out one of the questions that came in online, yeah. and that one is, if the war is giving away its uh, IPs, what is then actually still the advantage of like patenting, patenting yeah, different aspects. So what I said, this was actually making access. So uh, access to the IP. So IP can be given away in different ways. So you have exclusive rights, semi-exclusive rights. In this case, we are giving it away for plant, plant use because that's also the need uh, of the R and only in the global South for uh, in emerging economies where it will be used for non-commercial applications. Such patents can also be used in other applications, medical use. So this, this is where we can create revenues because we need to, patents cost a lot to the university then it, that, that, that need to be maintained and filed. And this revenues can fund and funnel further research and education. So, so there is sort of a, that's why I showed the whole cycle. It, 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 it's a, a cycle that also brings in uh, further investment back to, the, to fund our own research. There has been one more question online. 
Uh, I'll just read it out. Okay. Yeah, the last question that came in was, uh, how efficient are the patents managed by the patent holder? And are they actively checking the market who uh, is used to their patents and demand fees? Yeah, I think uh, I would not be able to answer this at this moment, uh, uh, by probably because I, I don't really uh, work on the management side, I have colleagues, but maybe Ruben in, the, in his talk can actually, uh, he is a patent attorney, so he might be able to give a clear answer of that question. Thank you. Okay, uh, if that was it, I would like to thank you, Suraj, for your nice talk. Uh, and we are gonna continue with the next talk from Dr. Michel de Vries. Michel obtained his PhD in crop science as well at Wageningen University. And since 2018, he's a research team lead at Linka Hybrid Potato Breeding, relatively young uh, plant breeding company that has been around since 2000 and, uh, 2007, if I'm not uh, wrong. And uh, he's gonna tell us how new genomic techniques and intellectual property can uh, benefit or maybe not to the young plant breeding company. So yeah, please, uh, floor is yours. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, just a minute, my presentation will be put up. Yes, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for putting it up. So uh, indeed, uh, yeah. So uh, thanks for the nice introduction, which means that I can skip my personal introduction. Uh, uh, shortly, something about Solinta, who, who, uh, who don't know uh, that, uh, started up in 2009 uh, from uh, the right to see it's a, a vegetable breeding company. Uh, 2011, they went public on hybrid potato breeding. Uh, so that is our main focus. So we have developed a hybrid potato, potato breeding uh, company. Uh, 2014, we were uh, awarded uh, national I, I icon and developed into a yeah, proper company uh, with about uh, uh, 10 people in 2015 when I joined. Um, and last year, we had uh, funding rounds of uh, uh, 21 million. And uh, we started the joint breeding, uh, 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 joint breeding program with uh, AVB, a uh, potato starch comp comp company. And we have uh, also uh, potato hybrids in uh, 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 submitted for variety, uh, variety registration. And so we've, you know, uh, with all of this, we grow to uh, more than 80 uh, people. Um, and indeed, so I am working there at uh, Solicilinta as the head of the research. So that covers uh, uh, topics like uh, trade discovery, uh, bioinformatics, cell biology, physiology, and cropping systems. So quite a broad number of disciplines, but all focused on hybrid uh, potato, potato. And we don't do that uh, alone, but we do that together in more than 20 collaborative projects with academia. Um, so shortly, two, uh, yeah, two, uh, yeah, two slides about, you know, about, about the technology of uh, Solenta. Well, we have to provide more, uh, we have to uh, uh, grow more food, better food. Uh, we have to provide more nutritious food with less agrochemicals and less water, water in crops that are resilient to climate change. And potato is excel excellently positioned to do, to, do, to do that. However, it has two, today it has two major draw drawbacks. Uh, conventional potato is grown from clonally propagated seed tubers. So um, yeah, they go slow. They are prone to disease, disease, disease diseases. Also, lo um, yeah, logistics are quite quite inefficient, um, and they are heat, very heterozygous tetraploids, going a bit into gene genetics. So breeding is um, yeah um, quite slow and not very e e e efficient. And as a result of that, farmers are still using varieties of more than 100 years old which are free of any IP rights, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, 
So, you know, by developing a, a, a hybrid breeding system, we, we have, you know, we have solved these two problems and uh, yeah, we have uh, uh, dev uh, uh, developed potato or high hybrids which come in the form of true seeds. And they have, uh, yeah, they have some advantages that uh, they can be scaled up very, very, very fast and you need only very uh, uh, tiny amount uh, to sow the sodium. So instead of 10 copies a year in a traditional tuber system, you can make thousands of copies a year. So you can uh, go to the market much faster uh, compared to seed tubers. There's uh, very few diseases on true, uh, true seeds. So you can reach the market with better, 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 better material materials. Well, they are uh, much e easier to transport and um, yeah, so your supply chain is much more efficient. So that's one part. So secondly, it was um, uh, it's all about the genetics, right? So so uh, uh, so the problem was that these tetraploid uh, 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 well tetraploid uh, genetics is quite inefficient. When you go to diploid potato, which uh, 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 of which there are a lot. Uh, cre creating homozygous, homozygous parent lines was a problem because there were no plants that could be self-compatible um, until this Japanese re researcher found, found a wild potato that could actually uh, as, uh, a self. So this was pu published in 1998. So um, yeah, uh, we yeah we have used that knowledge and started to work on. You know, uh, finding finding cell finding the cause of this self compatibility and also using that. So we have used it in a breed, breeding pro 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 program, develop, develop de developing vigorous uh, vigorous inbred lines, um, and you know, and these inbred lines uh, uh, they can be crossed and they yield seeds. So you can see on the picture that that's in those berries. That's where the true seeds are. Um, so. Uh, so and in that process, you know, we 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 have uh, uh, yeah we have looked for actually the cause of the gene that well the causal gene that that uh, that created that uh, self that self compatibility, and well this is the 533 uh, 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 nucleotide insertion in the promoter re region uh, that is the yeah that is uh, uh, really where uh, um, uh, where the difference was. And my colleague Ernst and Ernst Jan is uh, the first author of this paper that we published uh, la last year. Last year, uh, uh, sharing this uh, uh, sharing this knowledge uh, with the public. So that is basically how how we you know how we uh, how we uh, how we have worked. So in breeding, um, uh, all our work is really dri driven by innovation. So we 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 you know we have we have to make new things your uh, customers they always want the best varieties and they always want better varieties and today uh, they want varieties that are uh, adapted to climate change uh, uh, less environmental impact co corporate social responsibility well all these things uh, um, you have to take them into account so all the you know the, the number of demands from the public increases so new trades are needed better me methods are are, 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 are are needed and this is an integral part of the business model of a breeding co com company however you, you you've seen the timelines 1998 2001 so long timelines high risk of failure we also did a lot of things that didn't work so um, uh, yeah so it's yeah so it's a risky business um, and you can have, you know, you can have, a, you can have an invention, but it's only when you create the value, you know, from 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 that that it becomes really an innovation. And how you capture that value, that is, yeah, that's that is the that's the that's the part of your company's business model. So you're not just working uh, as a sci scientist, but always integrated, uh, integrated with the business. So. Um, at the moment, well, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, 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 the previous talker already has, has shown a number of ways how to protect an invention, but, uh, you know, at, at, um, uh, when you have an invention, yeah, you need to, you need to describe it in a, yeah, invention disclosure form. 
Um, and then you have to evaluate with your business people. So not just as the sci sci scientist, how to protect it. And then you can you know, take a decision on how to do, to do, to do this. So that involves already uh, talking not only with, uh, among other sci scientists, but also with business uh, people. So you can decide to share it. Um, um, uh, do you want to share to you to share to share to share share it or, or not, um, or you want to really keep it secret? So if you want to keep it secret, you can keep it as a trade secret, and otherwise it can be patented. So some considerations on these uh, patents. Um, actually, patents are um, yeah help you to uh, to yeah to protect your invention. Um, not only that you can you know, get a license or, or obtain revenues from others, but it also protects you from others blocking you. So if so, if uh, if somebody else uh, uh, would have been earlier with hybrid potato breeding and would have had a patent on it, that would have been really uh, 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 re really a disaster for our company. So you know, uh, uh, having a patent can be a very good defensive uh, stra 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 strategy, um, and you can actually uh, 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 use patents to yeah to allow for share sharing with other well with with academia or with other comp com com companies through yeah through different types of licensing, um, and um, yeah and and uh, if you have a, if you have, have have a patent, often it's easier to collaborate. Than if it's only just in trade secrets, um, and you know breakthrough in innovations they take time. Um, so between 2011 and 2019, we have had uh, uh, quite a, a, a number of uh, pre presentations in academic uh, uh, conferences, and we were laughed at. Really, so, yeah, people didn't believe this. Um, but you know, since this year, and it's, well, since since uh, congresses are coming up, so um, uh, 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 in in potato con, con, in potato uh, conferences, um, uh, most pre pre presentations are now around hybrid potato, potato potato. So it's you know it's coming, but it takes a long time. Um, but then you're. The public opinion is something that is very important, important uh, because society actually provides you a license to operate. I mean, you uh, you create an innovation and you create a product, but that has to be accepted by society, 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 society. And for that, you need to be open and transparent about what you do. So. You know, and that is why most innovations they fail. Well, not because it was a, a wrong technology, but something else went wrong. Um, just as a exact exact example, how this you know how this worked. So um, uh, uh, we have filed the pay the patent in uh, two thousand nine. Uh, uh, U.S. Pay, uh, patent. It was grant granted in uh, twenty twenty one, which is uh, very nice. Um, but if you know if 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 uh, 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 yeah we want we also wanted to go uh, yeah we want to go to go, to go public and share is share this uh, share this with uh, others and in 2011 we had a there was a there was a there was a publication of two two co-authors Herman van Eck Richard Fischer they are in the room um, and uh, so already in 2011 we could you know we could uh, we could discuss this. With other uh, 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 with other researchers and with other uh, 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 and with other stakeholders, and since then we've you know we've uh, a, li a list of twenty publications in you know in uh, in academic jour journals, and we could not have written them without you know the security of this patent application that was behind it. If not, we uh, yeah no we uh, uh, must have uh, kept it as a trade secret. So that is, you know, this is that that is a that is a kind of a freedom that actually gives, uh, uh, yeah, helps. Uh, th there, the patent helped us to uh, to share our innovation. So, moving now to the new genomic uh, tech, uh, uh, yeah, uh, to the new genomic techniques. So, these new editing uh, 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 techniques they allow faster innovation. 
Um, and yeah, and I think we can translate uh, fundamental science to application much faster than before. So there is, you know, that's where the acceleration happens. Also stacking of traits. So uh, introducing one gene, you know, that takes some, some time, two takes, well, double the time. And, uh, 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 yeah, and often you, you, you want uh, many, uh, yeah, many uh, genes. So in a um, and uh, uh, Avebe, for, for instance, our collaborator wants at least uh, 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 10 resistant genes in, in, their, uh, um, yeah, in their newest potato, potato. So that is, uh, uh, you know, that takes time. If we can do it faster, yeah, that is, yeah, that's better for the market. Um, yeah, we see indeed, uh, yeah, as was shown be be before, um, uh, uh, there is out, 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 outside the, the EU is uh, acceptance and deregulation. Um, and yeah, but we, we see, well, we can do hybrid potato with these techniques and we can do also without, with the aid of these techniques, we can go faster. Um, and we see ourselves really as users of these te 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 techniques, not inventors. As was said, you know, most of these patents were all, are, are actually held by universities. So it's really basic fundamental science that you know where yeah that has uh, deve develop develop de developed this knowledge. And we are kind of just uh, just users uh, of that. Um, yeah, but I think that it works, and I, th I think I think that there's there, there's many many examples of ap applications in the potato. So at least eighteen single gene traits have already been proven and identified. To, yeah, yeah, to show to work with, uh, uh, yeah, through uh, gene editing. Um, and then, well, if we if we if we think how can we apply this, um, I, I think I think you, there's yeah there's two phases. There's really as a research tool and more as a product development tool. And I think these uh, these are two really different things. And um, as a research tool, this is what you. Well, this is similar to what you what you are used to, um, yeah, maybe in academia where you uh, do hypothesis test, te testing, testing to, to see uh, gene X is, uh, you know, is, is, yeah, it's causing phenotype Y. Um, yeah, and um, this can be done through, done through editing techniques quite, quite efficiently. So it's commonly used um, and it allows you to faster test all these type of uh, hypotheses. Uh, you can also do that in a company, but then you need a specific research license to do, to do that. Um, however, if you want to go to a next step, so, you know, develop really a product, then, you know, so then you know already that there's a cer certain gene or a certain edit that causes a specific phenotype that you want. Um, and you want to develop a variety that, yeah, that, that using that technique. So you have to think about stacking of different traits, whether that you know technically wor works, and also scaling up. I mean, making an edit in one one plant is something, but then selling selling a bag of seeds, having all these edit edits, that's something else. So that yeah, these are important things to think about, um, and you also need different types of licenses for for the, for for this to have really a commercial license. So that's something really different than just uh, research. And um, this takes up resources. I mean, you, yeah, you need to, yeah, you need to have a molecular biology lab, you need to have bioinformatics support, you need to have these license, I need to have a really a method to bring this to the market. So all this takes, you know, all of this has really a large impact on your business. It's, you have to plan these resources, have to, plan all these licenses, I have to nego negotiate them and it has to fit your business model. And, then, and, from, a, and, and, and from the Solinto point of view, I mean, we are in the startup phase. We, well, we have to decide whether we spend it on this or on something else. I mean, if we cannot do field trials with our, our, our potatoes, but we can do this, well, uh, we, you have to uh, uh, balance this. Uh, uh, you have to balance the pros and cons. Um, and uh, some, so yes, you can do a lot with the new, new uh, with these new genomic technologies. But what are some of the challenges? Um, well, one of the challenges were, it, it, yeah, was already mentioned. So there's many different options. 
uh, yeah, and all the options have their own pros and cons. So do you want only to make knockouts? Do you want to make knock-ins? Do you want to make knock-in uh, a, a whole cassettes? What, what, mean, what is the exact application that you want? And what is then the platform that you're going, 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 going to use? So every, every few months, there's a new type of platform which is being deva 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 developed with their own uh, uh, pros and cons, their own efficiencies, because that is something that is also quite, uh, quite important. Doing something once is nice, but if we want to do it routinely, then, yeah, then efficiencies uh, yeah, yeah, become really important. So you have to think about which of these technologies fits your specific purpose best. And for that, you need to have a deeper understanding of this technology because yeah, uh, just, uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, just one can, uh, yeah, can, can have in the end a, a, a very, uh, cannot exactly fit your, uh, 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 what you want. So, and then there's licensing. Well, there was already uh, talked about, um, Indeed, the uh, Cray CRISPR is very dynamic. That's yeah, that yeah, that's all. Uh, and um, also, one of the questions just came. So, so uh, um, uh, yeah, how uh, can you afford as a company to have actually that knowledge and to follow all that whole IP uh, landscape? There's, I think, uh, maybe in in the world, even very few people that. Uh, know this la landscape uh, um, um, yeah very well and then if you have a license yeah the licensors may have very specific conditions so so you can do it only for re-research but not for product development or if you do it for product development then well in well in certain countries for certain markets well it's yeah it becomes quite complex yeah yeah it becomes quite complicated and then, you know, from a business perspective, you could say, well, if it is very risky, if it is very, yeah, very expensive, let's outsource it. So that, you know, that's, 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 um, yeah, that is something uh, uh, I think that many companies would, uh, yeah, would like to do, um, yeah, to outsource such type of uh, activ activities. And for that, you always need to make a choice. Um, really from the innovators perspective okay we want to make something new we want to make new inventions but it has to fit with your business and it has to so uh, and it has to be aligned with your resource uh, pla planning so this is um, yeah that brings uh, quite uh, a lot of tensions and uh, uh, interesting discussions in your company um so yeah, so 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 uh, you know, bring bring it uh, 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 to a yeah to a more pa pa paradigm big shift perspective. Uh, yes, we need all these uh, new technologies, and 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 these yeah these are key to accelerate our innovation. But it has really to fit this yeah this equation of the technology, the value capture, your business model and the consumer acceptance. So all of these, you know, boxes need to be ticked and it needs to, yeah. Uh, if, if, and uh, you have to have simultaneous uh, attention for all of these aspects. And that is quite, uh, yeah, that is quite difficult. Um, and as, you know, as a plant breeding commu community, we need to be, uh, yeah, tra transparent on, on, on this to get to get actually this license to operate from society, because that is in the long term the most important thing. It's it yeah, it's, you know technological. I mean we are you know we we are trained to solve technological uh, questions, but if we are not allowed uh, 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 by society to actually apply them, yeah, that is that is uh, uh, that is something that uh, we uh, that is hard to change, uh, and. Yeah, the only thing we can do is to be transparent about what we do and about yeah and uh, why and why why we do it. So, ending with a yeah more personal uh, uh, perspe perspe perspective actually from the last years what we've been doing at the Solinta surrounding uh, uh, surrounding pay patents and the newest technologies. Um, yeah, applying these technologies, it has, you know, it has, there's, there's many aspects to, to it, you know, it can be good, but it, it 
you have yeah you, you you it is just not something that you take from the shelf and you know apply it is not plug and play um and to really make that realization it, uh, it is not enough to be just a scientist uh, well, being a scientist is already quite difficult, but then, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you have to read and talk to the experts outside you, your, your, your field and develop real language to talk to your sale, to the sales salespeople, to talk to the legal people, the policymakers and the consumers. Um, and, and the last thing is uh, the, uh, the most difficult one, that you have to accept that it takes time and that you're not in control. Um, so that is uh, <laughs> indeed uh, uh, often the most difficult one. So in conclusion, Sol Solinta can do hybrid uh, potato with and without these, uh, 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 these new genomic uh, techniques with we can, uh, you know, with we can go faster. So it supports the acceleration. Uh, patenting can be, a, uh, can be a very, very powerful option to share your knowledge um, but it won't, when you want to shift really paradigms, you yeah yeah you need to in, invest a lot of time and uh, money. Um, and uh, when you apply these, uh, uh, all the different pieces need to fit. Um, and when looking at uh, looking back, and when you work in such a long uh, young company, you must be a jack of all trades to know all of these uh, different uh, topics. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Michael, for your really nice and interesting talk. And we already have one question online from Louise. And she says, it seems that public acceptance for NGTs in agriculture is quite important for research and plant breeding. However, often, lock, often lacking, especially in Germany. So I was wondering which strategies you suggest to improve this acceptance? And other than being transparent or how exactly would you achieve this transparency? Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, one part of being uh, transparent is as a company participate uh, in, uh, well, share some, uh, share part of your knowledge. So, uh, through academic collaboration, through ri uh, ri uh, writing uh, scientific art articles that are open source, you, you can share part of your knowledge in which you tell uh, uh, really what you do. Uh, often, often companies, they are afraid to share a lot of their knowledge because, uh, because most, pe mo most companies say, uh, um, yeah, everything is a secret. Well, you know, there's quite a lot of things that you can share. So uh, yeah, this is one way to uh, yeah one way to uh, open up, um, and also yeah going outside, not 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 hiding in your company, but you know participating in the public discu discussions. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Michiel, for the nice presentation. But one thing I was missing in your presentation is the fact that uh, would you have been able to reach the stage where you are now if you didn't have had patents? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> um, well, probably not, actually. No, no, probably not. Because if, if we would have not have had patents, we would have needed to do everything you know, uh, uh, have everything under a trade secret. Um, so that means we could not be able, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, be open about, about it. So attracting funding, um, attracting collaborations would not be possible. So I think, no, I think you're, yeah, no, I think it's a good, I think it's a good suggestion that, that I think without, without the patents, we would not be able to go this far. To follow up on the first question as well, because you mentioned that you share a lot of your data with scientists and you write a publication, of course, but that usually stays a bit within the scientific community. Are you also reaching out to the general public to talk about your inventions? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So, so indeed, you, you, you know, there's, you know, there's different channels to, to reach different stakeholders. So, uh, for instance, we are doing something that 
could maybe have a large effect on a number of you know whole group of farmers in the Netherlands. So we have since since since, since quite some years we dis, you know we have open discussions with uh, uh, seed potato far farmers in the Netherlands and they yeah they uh, you know we invite them to come to see us and we all also invite them to come to well to see our yeah to see what we do. Um, so those are really the far the farmers. We have also worked with the Ratenau Institute to, um, yeah, to yeah, to do a study uh, uh, on the ex ante impact of our invention on the whole potato value chain, which was then presented uh, yeah to the members of par Parliament in the Netherlands. So that's that's another channel you know trying to reach uh, yeah those groups of stakeholders. So different stakeholders, different channels. Yes. So my question relates a bit to what was asked before from you, um, because you were talking a lot uh, how having patents gave you the opportunity to publish your knowledge essentially in the broader scientific community. Um, but for me, the way you said it, it also sounded very much like we had to patent it because we were afraid others would patent it or find it faster than us. And that gave the security to, to have investment uh, flowing into the company. But that's kind of not an argument in favor of patents, because if you wouldn't have patents at all, then you would also not be afraid that a competitor would patent before you, right? So it's, a, it's like, for me, a bit of a strange argument in favor of patents. So, yeah, but then, uh, uh, but then the discussion would be, so what would be uh, uh, other ways to kind of uh, capture and and uh, yeah and have returns on investment on r d investments because you were ahead in research you would have launched a product first probably anyways because you were the experts right it's just a like a thought experiment because uh somehow this was very much in like, assuming patents still exist as a concept yeah <laughs> okay, thank you okay thanks I think there was one more question online. Um, yeah, the question is from an early career scientist um, in potato breeding in the US. And uh, I'm not even sure if he or she is asking, um, how does your patent on hybrid true potato seed breeding influence breeding programs in the US and globally? How can small breeding uh, programs gain access to this method? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, very simple. Uh, 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 talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Gaining access means that we, ha yeah, have to, yeah, have to start uh, talk talking how uh, how we can arrange uh, access. Easy. Yeah. Uh, Enjoy the answer. <laughs> nice. And there is the second one. And that one was, uh, if new breeding te uh, techniques allow for faster breeding, resulting in higher value and therefore more expensive seeds, how would these seeds remain affordable for small farmers? Um, yeah, seeds, well, uh, seeds are not about the price, it's about the value that they return. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I think yeah, I think that is basically the answer. So if I, so if we make through yeah through more investment a, a, a seed which is more expensive, but then gives the farmer, you know, double a a double revenue, well probably the farmer will be happy to, yeah to uh, uh, yeah to spend more money on, uh, uh, on the seeds, but I mean farmers are not obliged to buy our seeds; they do that voluntarily. Well, I find your presentation very interesting, but also somewhat confusing. Um, breeding can bring, can achieve everything, but it takes time and money to get all these recombination events and to bring all together. New breeding techniques are a kind of quick fix to bring stuff into a genome more easily. The whole idea of Solinta was to make breeding, traditional breeding, faster. And if you now argue that 
you rely on new breeding techniques, uh, why wouldn't we be able in conventional potatoes, tetraploid outbred potatoes, if they can also use those new breeding techniques, then I think Solinta has lost its advantage because then the quick fix is also available to traditional breeding. So don't you think that entering the domain of new breeding techniques is undermining the special niche that Solinta has created for itself? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Herman, for this. Uh, yeah, for this uh, interesting question. Um, no, I do, well, I don't agree. That's that's that, Yeah, that's a short answer. But 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 one um, uh, uh, indeed, you know, tra traditional tetraploid potato breeding can also apply new breeding techniques, and they can also, you know, yes. Uh, 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 they can they can also in, in, in insert small events or make deletions that is yeah similar to us indeed uh, we don't have a we don't have an advantage uh, advantage over tetraploid breed, uh, breed, breed breeding when it comes to new breeding techniques but still scaling up um, uh, 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 still goes faster. Uh, and uh, I think there is, well, you know, also as a gene potato gene geneticist, there's many traits that are uh, more difficult to fix, uh, uh, that are not just single genes, uh, 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 simple, yeah, simple edits. And I think there we'll, yeah, we will, uh, uh, yeah, we will, we are retaining uh, the, uh, our edge. Uh, so I think it can go hand in hand hand in hand, but I think you have a point that uh, um, uh, that these techniques, they are available to all potato breeders. So yeah, in a, yeah. So in a, a essence, there's no competitive advantage for any breeder. Uh, I think Solinta has a stronger position if they also say, we are the GMO free method. Yes, that is what we are doing right now. That's, that is also what we, uh, uh, what I am saying. We don't need it, but we can use them. Okay, for the sake of the time, yeah. I would like to thank you, Michiel, for your really interesting talk and everyone else for the really nice discussion. Now we are going to go for a coffee break until uh, three o'clock sharp. So I would like to ask panelists to be here just a few minutes earlier to set up everything. And uh, people at home or whatever they are uh, who are joining online, please also be there back at three o'clock. And the coffee break is going to be downstairs at the ground floor. Can it be your microphone settings? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. OK. So just to say it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I would like to introduce you the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. Uh, this is the international organization established by the of Convention. This treaty was adopted in 1961. And nowadays there are uh, 78 uh, UPOL members covering 97 states because we have the European Union and the OAPI, the African Intellectual Property Organization. Um, we are also engaging with around 50 states and two intergovernmental organizations in the procedure to become a UPOL member. And the reason for UPOL to exist is to actually provide and promote an effective system for plant variety protection with the aim of encouraging the development of new varieties of plants for the benefit of society. In this regard, is really a space for international cooperation and harmonization 
in order to ensure that the, this constant, I would say, encouragement and uh, for breeding new varieties and constant progress in breeding. And in that regard, in order to answer to some of the challenges that we have nowadays in relation to food security, mitigating or addressing climate change and uh, offering opportunities for trade and development. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Yolanda. And then for our last online speaker, uh, welcome Sonia Scherge. I really apologize if my, ex uh, my pronunciation is not okay, but she's the Director of Intellectual Property and Legal Affairs at Euroseeds. Yes, hello. Good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. So my name is Sonia Scherge, um, and indeed I work for Euroseeds, um, which is the European Regional Seed Association. So um, we are an association based in Brussels. Um, and as an association, we have a regional membership, which consists of national seed associations and seed companies. So it's basically a dual membership. Uh, we also have companies who are directly members of our association. And we also have um, seed related businesses who can actually participate in our work. Um, obviously, I think you heard it also from, from uh, um, the previous speaker from the breeding industry that IP is one of the most important topics in our association's work. Um, because of course, plant breeding is a long-term um, endeavor and it's very time consuming and also requires a lot of investment. So um, there is a need for IP because the product of plant breeding is of very high value also from an economic, a social and an environmental point of view. Uh, but it's a product which is very easy to copy. So IP protection can help to actually conserve this value and to provide a possibility for breeders to have um, to recoup their investment. So uh, what I do actually is I, I deal mainly with IP protection and access to genetic resources within the association. My background is legal, so I'm not a scientist, I'm not a plant breeder, uh, but I try to uh, follow up on all the IP related issues within the association. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Then I will shift our attention to the two people on the stage. And I'd like to start with introducing Martin Brink. He's a policy advisor at the Center for Genetic Resources here at the Wageningen University. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, my name is Martin Brink. I'm working at the Center for Genetic Resources in the Netherlands, uh, the CGN, which uh, forms part of Wageningen University in Research. And uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, CGN. Um, at CGN, our main activity is, is the maintenance of the Dutch National Gene Bank, uh, plants and animals. Uh, we keep about uh, 25,000 accessions of, plant, of plant accessions and uh, about 300,000 uh, uh, samples of, of uh, uh, mainly semen of animals. And, uh, well, as for the plants, we are uh, mainly keeping uh, the accessions in the form of seeds, but we also have uh, an apple collection, a live apple collection. And, uh, some, some of our apple trees are also, can also be found on the campus here in, 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 the, in the small farm. Um, apart from uh, keeping the National Gene Bank, we're also involved in supporting uh, activities on in city research and on farm uh, conservation in, in the Netherlands, supporting farms organization, uh, protecting traditional varieties, and also uh, supporting organizations in protecting uh, uh, crop wild relatives uh, kept under natural conditions. And uh, an, another very important pillar of the work of CGN is uh, policy advisory work, especially in the field of uh, genetic resources policies. Uh, we are uh, we're supporting the government in international negotiations. We support the government in implementation. And uh, uh, one very specific aspect of our work is that we are uh, carrying out the work of the national focal point on access and benefit sharing on the Nagoya Protocol, uh, of which many of you have heard already, but probably. And, and uh, international treaty on planetary resources, food and agriculture. And uh, well, that, that's, that's also a very important part of the work of CGN. And uh, as for me personally, I'm working on that part of CGN. And uh, although I'm working on policies, I'm not a lawyer myself. Uh, in contrast to Sonja, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Uh, I studied tropical crop science. I graduated here in, uh, in the Edwagen University. I, uh, have, uh, did uh, work for years in the plant-related projects uh, uh, in the Netherlands at uh, Burr and abroad. 
And uh, I've been working at CGN on the policy work since 2012. Uh, I was invited here on this symposium. Uh, I, I, I must say here that I'm not, I'm not a patent specialist, a IPR specialist, but uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm looking at it more from, from, the, from, the, from the side of gene bank, from the, the biodiver agrobiodiversity perspective, and of course, from the, from the access and benefits perspective. Yes, so I hope I can, uh, can, uh, can contribute to this discussion. I'm pretty sure we have some interesting questions for you. Uh, finally, I think we have someone who doesn't need any introduction for the people from Wageningen, but with us today is Richard Visser. He's the chair and the professor of the Department of Plant Breeding, also here at the VER. And please introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you uh, very much. Good afternoon, everyone. As said, my name is Richard Visser. Um, I'm uh, involved in plant breeding research for over 30 years now. I didn't do my uh, degree studies here in Wageningen, so one of the few exemptions. I did it in Groningen, biology. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think here is a, the center of plant research in the Netherlands, and, and we are the only uh, plant breeding uh, group at university level within the Netherlands. So that means that we have to uh, let's say collaborate and, and do collaborate with a lot of external parties on, on many different topics. Our main strength lies in uh, breeding for uh, vegetables, potatoes and uh, ornamentals. Um, and we have experience uh, because we have a number of varieties as, as plant breeding, uh, but we also have quite a number of patents. Uh, in fact, I think we have something around 40 patents uh, and I'm co-inventor on 25 patents. And um, I think it has already been mentioned, but, but I can stress it again. Uh, it's very important to have protection of your uh, knowledge and of your findings and of your material, uh, because that's a way to, in the end of the day, we, we are not a breeding company. We don't make money actually with the breeding work we do, but that's the way to make money from your inventions and to at least decide what can be done with your inventions. And you can give it away for free, or you can ask a lot of money for it and, and get uh, filthy rich if you want. If you um, so everything in between. So there are a lot of uh, uh, things which are very important to, uh, to keep track of having IP or uh, plant patents and yeah, what is the best and, and whether the new genomic techniques are still fitting, let's say in the legislation and the rules we have currently for IP and also palm breeders' rights, well, that remains to be seen, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks for that introduction, Richard. Uh, I want to stay with you for the moment because we have talked a lot now about patents and plant breeders' rights. And I'll ask Yolanda in a bit to explain us a bit more about plant breeders' rights. But I think first we need to answer a question that hasn't really been answered yet. When we CRISPR a plant, does it fall under a patent or would we use plant breeders' rights? Well, if, if you... If you would do the, the, the uh, actual uh, events of it and you have the invention of having found a new gene or a new function of a gene, then you could patent it. Uh, and you could patent, for instance, uh, the solanaceous crops or whatever, but you could not patent that specific plant because then if you want to protect that specific plant, then you have to go to uh, plant breeders' rights to protect that particular Variety. I see someone nodding. That's not correct. Well, we will hear in a minute. <laughs> but in, in principle, uh, you can protect uh, in a patent uh, gene families, uh, but not a specific variety, not a specific plant. Yeah, because of... in in the US, you have indeed a different situation where you have plant patents and you also have normal patents, and there, uh, well, it's it's more or less common to ask for both, so that you have a kind of dual protection which is not possible in, 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 in Europe. Uh, and, and there are some other countries which have also kind of uh, in between uh, ways of doing it. But in general, you might say, well, uh, patents are for, let's say inventions, what already has been said. So novel, uh, a lot of other things. And plant breeders rights is for a particular plant. Plant variety. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so if we know what a gene does then, if I understand it correctly, we mutate it so that we know its function, then you could patent the function of that gene and protect it. Well, if, if you would mutate it and you would use gene, genome editing, then it might be. If mm -hmm. you would use um, uh, EMS mutagenesis, then not, because that's a, you cannot distinguish that from, let's say, a normal mutation occurring. So that would be an essential biological process and does not patent it. That's interesting. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, then something that you mentioned already is that uh, university also has quite some patents. Do we also have plant breeders, right? Are there varieties from the university, from Wageningen University I'm talking about? Well, not well. Uh, I mean, we are Wageningen University in research, uh, so we have both entities. Um, but we, we do have on, on the Wageningen research side from our predecessors, we still have, let's say, material from which uh, varieties came. So, but that's mostly in, in those crops where there is no real commercial interest from the companies in the Netherlands. So, in Krambe, Calendula, um, Guayule, and some other not, not so familiar crops. Um, if we have something in potato, for instance, then we are not going to ask for uh, plant breeders rights ourselves, but we, we think it is suitable for a particular market and thus a particular company, and then we offer it to them if they want to have it or not. And then there is a kind of uh, you know, rule of thumb that uh, more or less half of the earnings will come to us and half the earnings will go to the company, but they take care of all the commercial aspects. of it. Okay, okay. That also is quite interesting, and that brings me to the next point, because uh, at least for the university, research is mostly funded by public money, and there can be, uh, you, some people might say that since we are getting paid for by the society, what we should do should benefit society as well, and I think some people might think that getting a patent or plant breeders rights might be counterintuitive to that, to bringing benefit to society. What are your views on that? Well, I think the, the idea that uh, most uh, research is funded by, let's say, public funding at the university is, is a bit, well, obsolete, outdated, uh, because in, in all kinds of different programs nowadays, uh, companies have to be involved, even within the pure fundamental science projects like NWO, uh, which is maybe good, but to a certain extent not so good. Because even if you pay only 5%, then you still want to decide where the research is going. So in that sense, uh, and then there are specific rights. Uh, so if you pay 5%, then it might be that you have a first right to talk about maybe acquiring a license or whatever. But if you pay 50%, it might be that, yeah, that you own it or that you at least have a, a much bigger say in, in what's going to happen. Yeah. And so, But in all those kind of researches, it's very important to... Yeah, to keep an eye open for the interests of the companies. So uh, you can indeed not just publish anything. You always have to discuss with them. Is this something which could be, uh, let's say, worthwhile protecting either through uh, IPR or uh, whatever way? Yeah. So that, that is something which is very important. Yeah. And that then all depends on how you negotiate with the company, but also how much of the total um, project is being funded from industry yeah and and that depends a bit on on let's say the the, the funding stream uh, because uh, like nwo has exact formulations on how it is taken care of as does the top sector uh, but if you do it with a company and they pay everything uh, then it's obvious that they will uh, want also uh, everything back but i think for also for universities uh, it's very important to uh, like i said in the beginning it's very important to have the ability to uh, have patents and and we have a number of patents mostly on genes and whatever but uh, for instance if it would be a methodology patent then that would be very interesting for a university to have because then you can outsource that to a lot of people who want to use your methodology and then get uh, some some interest uh, from that back or money back and with that money you can do let's say free research because there's no one saying what you have to do yeah. which in the end of the day might be very beneficial to society as well yeah yeah that's a good point. Um, I think we need a update of what plant breeders' rights are. So Yolanda, could you perhaps explain to us exactly what plant breeders' rights are and how they came to be? Thank you for the opportunity. So the International Convention just set the international framework, but then this convention needs to be implemented at the national or regional level, let's say at the European Union level. So if you know anyone can become a breeder, if you develop a new variety that is new, and please forget everything you know about novelty in patents, because novelty in plant breeders' rights is about whether or not you have commercialized, like commercial exploitation of the variety prior certain grace periods prior to the filing date. So it does not compare your variety with 
candida variety with any other variety. Then we come to distinguish uniformity and stability. And it's back to the point, you know, a variety is a group of plants that you can distinguish from another group of plants for a set of characteristics. And in that regard, uh, you need to compare your candidate varieties with all other candidate varieties, uh, with all other varieties that are a matter of common knowledge, whether protected or non-protected. And there, you know, there is a lot of work that is done at the technical level between you both members and the experts to harmonize and cooperate in what we call uh, examination of the US. So distinctness is one of the conditions, then uniformity and stability, because you need to ensure they you know that after further reproduction, those characteristics remain unchanged because the farmer or the grower would be very unhappy if you know it's purchasing a particular variety with a set of characteristics that will give this farmer competitive advantage. And at the end, you know, the variety is not uniform and stable. So as a summary, these four conditions: novelty, commercial novelty distinguish uniformity and stability. And then a name, very important. It's very important to have a name for a variety and the same name in all group of members, because this is what will serve as an identifier of a variety, very different from trademarks. Trademarks may play also a role in the commercial strategy, but the name of the variety is really essential to ensure also international trade and other aspects that are very important. So once you uh, comply with these conditions of protection, the plant breeder's rights uh, can be granted. And as I said, anyone can become a breeder. So it could be a farmer breeder. I think in the Netherlands, there are many potato breeders that are farmer breeders. Could be a company, could be a plant breeders uh, a research institute, university, cooperative of farmers. There are very successful breeding companies that originally were cooperative of farmers. And as it was mentioned before in the introduction, we've seen that a great majority of actually the applicants and the holders of plant breeders rights are small companies. I think the study in the European Union reported that 93%. So yeah, it's a system that is very vibrant and very accessible. Thank you. Maybe we can develop later if there are follow-up questions. Thank you, Yolanda. You mentioned something quite interesting here because you said, uh, if I understood correctly, 93% of the plant breeders rights are held by small and medium enterprise companies, right? That goes a bit against a- In the European Union. Oh, in the European Union, thank you. So there's a common belief sometimes that having IP rights or plant breeders rights on plants is leading to monocultures in our agriculture. But it doesn't sound like that if 93% of the plants come from small, uh, medium enterprises. So what is your view on how these plant breeders rights are um, actually increasing our innovation and the variety in our agriculture? Um, I will say I will only comment about plant breeders rights because I can, you know, UPO does not address patents. But in relation to plant breeders rights is to the contrary. If we see the data, we have an increased number of uh, applications uh, every year, like uh, in uh, 2020, we have 22,000 uh, uh, number of applications, around uh, 40,000 rights granted also. And that shows that it's an increased number of filings, means new varieties reaching farmers, growers, and the market as a whole. We also see, a growing trend on the number of general species covered by plant breeders rights. If we look into the data in 2020, there were around uh, plant varieties filed or granted protection for 4,700 uh, general species. And if we compare the data in 2010, it was 3,553,000. ,000. So we see a, a constant increase and it was mentioned also in one of the presentations, one of the key features of the plant breeders' right system is the breeders' exemption that allows actually all protected varieties available in the market to be a source for further breeding. And this is to encourage constant progress in breeding. So what breeders want is diversity because it's from diversity that they can uh, continue breeding and accessibility. Uh, I think it will be covered also during the presentation and the panel discussion, the important role also of conservation of genetic resources. I think Martin, you are going to tackle on, on that. So for sure, it's very important conservation of genetic resources, very important policies, but those matters are not governed by the UPOF Convention. You know, the UPOF Convention Breeders' Rights is about giving the space to encourage um, investment in breeding and development of new varieties. 
Thanks. Um, we just heard from Richard that uh, CRISPR plants or plants bred with NGTs would not fall under plant breeders' rights, but most likely under patents. How do you see the future then if uh, breeder com breeding companies would use NGTs more often? What I would like to, to, to share with you is that there is a constant work in UPOF. You know, the governing mean of, uh, body of UPOF, the UPOF Council gives guidance and future direction of the organization. And if there are any developments that uh, are important for the impact of society, uh, matters are raised at the UPOF level to engage in providing guidance and development of new clear, I would say, explanations on the UPOF Convention. We are not addressing the, how any new technology may be protected by patents. This is outside our scope. But what we also are working is in uh, providing further clarity on the notion of essentially the right varieties under the UPOF Convention. As uh, you know, uh, there is this concept that was introduced in the 1991 Act of the UPOF Convention, and the key objective of introducing the notion of essentially the right varieties is to create incentives for a diversity of breeding, diversity of breeders, and uh, the different breeding techniques that may be used in a breeding program. The UPOF Convention is neutral about the technology that is used to develop a new variety of plant. It may be traditional breeding techniques, modern techniques, or a combination of both. Normally, this combination of both. The important thing is to ensure that there is incentive for all type of breeders and all type of breeding. And in this regard, currently there is a new, uh, I would say, uh, proposal to provide further clarity on the guidance on essentially the right variety, because that means in general, in a breeding program, you may use a diversity of um, sources and varieties. And with uh, new breeding techniques, it may be possible for more rapidly and quickly to develop a new variety that could be suitable for protection, just using one single variety. And in this case, there is a lot of discussion in relation to monoparentals, you know, in the case of mutation, uh, whether that would be considered an EDV, because in those cases, it's predominantly derived from one single variety, and then you know, the essential characteristics that are retained, the differences are a result of derivation. We have a lot of discussion to ensure that breeders can sit into the table and reach agreement, both those who use these traditional breeding techniques, but those who use uh, modern techniques. So they can find suitable ways forward to ensure that the varieties reach to the market. Uh, in the case of an essentially the right variety, if it's that variety considered such, you can protect it the same way as the other varieties, but then to commercialize the essentially the right variety, you will need the authorization of the breeder of the one single variety that you have uh, used for the obtaining that essentially the right variety, if the, if the initial variety is protected. So very important always to protect varieties. Very important to sit in the negotiating table. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, I'd like to shift now to Sonia. We've heard the uh, perspective already of the university and why it's important for us to use uh, IP. Can you tell us a bit more on why patents and plant breeders' rights are so important for industry? This topic we heard already a bit before, but I still like to hear uh, your opinion on that. Yes, of course. Um, so I think I mentioned briefly in my introduction that, um, of course, the, the, the outcome, so that the main yeah, the main outcome or the result of the breeding work that is carried out by the companies uh, is, of course, new plant varieties that they want to put on the market um, and sell to the farmers. And of course, there is a lot behind that new variety. There is a lot of time that was invested. There is a lot of financial and other resources that have been invested. So uh, the product itself has, has a high value, but uh, it's not only an economic value, but it's also an important value for society because uh, of course it contributes to food security. And it's also, it also carries an important environmental value because in many cases, new varieties are uh, uh, capable of tackling a lot of environmental and other challenges. So all that value um, and to be able to continue creating that value requires a possibility to be able to recover the investment that was put in uh, the development of that new product. So that is the, the, the reason why IP is needed. And uh, as far as the, the different IP rights are concerned, um, 
in principle, the, the, the IP right that has been used traditionally by the industry is plant variety protection, so plant breeders rights, because the result is a plant variety and the plant variety per se can only be protected by plant breeders rights, at least in Europe. So, uh, so that is the, the main IP right that the industry has been using. And of course, um, it has a lot of advantages for the sector. It's also, it's a sui generis IP system, which has been created specifically for this sector. Um, and, and that can be seen in the different features, which were also mentioned by Yolanda. One very important feature is of course, the breeder's exemption, which allows breeders to continue reusing uh, the, the new commercial varieties, even if they are protected under plant breeders rights, which is very important because one doesn't have to then go back and redo all the innovation which has already been done by another breeder, but can just take it from the market and uh, easily build up on it, so further innovate on it, which is very important in, um, in, um, in the seed sector because we need to be uh, capable, so we need to remain capable of um, innovating quickly and responding to new challenges all the time. So this breeder's exemption is something that our sector values a lot. Uh, but at the same time, of course, plant breeders rights is uh, making it possible for all the companies to, to still recoup their investments because uh, um, it, it very importantly protects them against uh, copying their work, which is because it's self-reproducing material, it's easier than in, in other industries to, to copy the end product. But of course, there are uh, some types of inventions in uh, plant breeding, which are not uh, plant varieties. Plant varieties. <laughs> and now I hear, now I hear my double. It's going yes, to be difficult. I guess. Trouble putting uh, Diana back on the screen here. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, now it's fine. Now I don't hear myself double. So, um, yeah, no, I was just uh, mentioning that there are other types of inventions in, uh, in the work that our member companies are carrying out, um, which are also innovative, but they cannot be protected by uh, plant breeders' rights because um, I'm thinking about uh, some breeding methods or some uh, traits that have been developed, which uh, genetic markers that have been identified, which are not plant varieties, so obviously they cannot be protected by plant breeders' rights, um, but still uh, there is a lot of innovation behind potentially, and that might require also uh, some sort of IP protection. So for those types of innovations, uh, patents offer a possibility to, uh, to, uh, to recoup the investment which, which has been put in the, in the development. So that is why um, our members actually use both IP rights, depending on the on the case, depending on on what is the um, the actual product that they would like to protect. I would just like to come back to something that you said because for plant breeders' rights, the goal is indeed to create new innovation because other companies can use your variety, but you hold the uh, the rights to that particular variety. But with yeah. patents, once you patent it, you re you have to ask for a license to be able to use it. So I know that patents are supposed to encourage innovation, but then only if companies are actively sharing licenses. Is that also something that's happening within the industry or how is that arranged? Um, well, in principle, uh, for, well, like for all IP rights, licensing is a bilateral matter. So it is to be arranged between companies. Um, but because of the specific nature of our industry, um, and because, of course, patents have been coming into the seed industry, let's say, as of the late 80s or beginning of the 90s, so, uh, and they haven't been there before, so the breeders were used to dealing with plant breeders' rights, and the, the infiltration, so to say, well, maybe it's not the right word, but the, the, the fact that patents uh, emerged also in, uh, in the fields of seeds and plants, um, started to be a little bit disturbing from a number of the companies simply because of um, simply because of the fact that they were just used to 
using all commercial varieties which are out there without uh, any need to check the IP status and uh, let alone to, to, to talk about any negotiations uh, for, for having access to the genetic material. So that created, of course, uh, some discussion and, and a lot of efforts to try to see what can be done about that uh, in order to facilitate or to, to rebalance the two systems to make sure that even in cases where a patent might um, be relevant in a, in a particular situation, the fact that there is no breeders exemption in patent law, but there would be a breeders exemption in plant breeders rights, that is of course an, an imbalance and how to put that balance back. Um, of course, there are some national laws which include some sort of a breeder's exemption, which allow for the use of the genetic material for breeding, but still, uh, in case you still have the patented element in your new variety, you need a license. And for those situations, um, there are some initiatives, for instance, in the vegetable breeding sector, uh, many companies, I think almost all the vegetable companies, um, created a platform, a licensing platform, where uh, uh, they, they have set up um, a standard system, which allows basically everybody who becomes member of this platform to, to require licenses to, um, to, the, to the traits that uh, others might have patented. So there are such initiatives which, uh, which facilitate access to, uh, to patented material. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's quite nice that there's a platform that you could join then in order to basically have an overview of the patterns that are on specific varieties. That's how I interpret that. Is that kind of correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to shift now to Diana because we've heard now the position of universities who create plants, the industry that creates plants, but we're not actually the ones that are growing them, farmers are. So I was just wondering what uh, Seya thinks about patents and plant breeders' rights on plants. Um, it would be hard to say what uh, Seja says in general, just because anytime I, I enter into one of these discussions, I find myself really as an auditor, as a person who needs to, to take this occasion to learn. Uh, because it is truly a, a kind of a, a mysterious world, even for the farming community. Um, I am not completely sure that farmers go into their traces completely aware of everything that is behind the concept of patent and uh, uh, even uh, plant breeding rights, which is, which is a pity because I really believe that this is... Uh, <laughs> It is really one of the choices or the type of knowledge that we're missing that would really, really strengthen the, the farmer's position in their choices, in the, in the freedom of choice and in making the best suitable choice for their uh, own um, farming system. This is the other thing I would like to highlight. It's very, it's always a very complicated exercise for us to find that common ground on which we build our positions because we represent a huge diversity of farming systems, of farming territories, of farming uh, products. Uh, so for there to be like a single answer that puts everyone around the table and has everybody agree on a concept is not always the easiest uh, task. It is one of the ones we work the most on, but definitely not the easiest one. Uh, so when it comes to, to plant patents and, and uh, I really believe that this is where we actually need to use much more time to build, uh, to fill in the gaps, the, the gaps, especially for the younger generation of farmers to, to have a, uh, a greater cooperation, even when it comes to, to this uh, breeding system, to understand what is really uh, necessary at, uh, at grassroots level. These are plants that will go into our fields and that will build our own competitiveness in the market. And uh, I really believe that there could be a lot of potential, like unexplored potential uh, there too for the farmers to use this as something that can help them uh, gain a little bit more space in the value chain. We were saying before that how these, uh, the new genomic techniques will also be something that will enhance the sustainability of farmers. Well, let's, let's all use this as an, a tool, as an instrument in, in communication and in the way we approach the market uh, and, and help uh, farmers be more, um, 
I'm thinking of the word in Italian, consapevoli, more uh, sure uh, and assertive in their choices when it comes to, to plant varietals and, and to what they use. If, I know I, it's not to elude the answer, but it's just to say that it's very hard to have a single answer when it comes to this, uh, this topic. Yeah, I, I can understand. I mean, you represent so many farmers, so many opinions. Not all, every situation is, of course, the same. Of course the same. Um, but out of curiosity, uh, since the 50s or something, we started, um, well, but let's say it differently. For the, before the 50s, I think every farmer would make their own varieties. And then after the 50s, this component of uh, farming life was basically uh, taken over and industrialized by breeding companies. And now it's really specialized where farmers grow the seeds and the breeding companies can offer them advice on which seeds to buy and which seeds to sow. Uh, and I was just curious about what your opinion uh, on whether this is a good thing or not that has happened, or whether you uh, whether farms should still uh, make their own crops and sow their own seeds. Well, in general, the farming system has gone through since the 50s a huge revolution. We, we, we've changed the machinery we use, we've changed the varieties we use, we've changed the chemical products we use. We've, we've changed the farming system. And, and of course, this has had its, its benefits. It's also had, of course, its counter effects, but we can't deny that it had its, uh, its benefits in, in helping us achieve uh, food safety across Europe. Um, does this mean that that was completely and 100% the right way to go? No, otherwise we wouldn't be having a huge debate on making the farming system more sustainable and more uh, ecologically uh, stable uh, right now or with a, a less negative impact. So could we also reallow the farmers to have a little bit greater independence uh, when it comes to these choices? I absolutely believe so. Um, but I also believe that we shouldn't deny the fact that there has been a huge uh, improvement when we did allow researchers and research facilities to, to um, kind of analyze the different uh, particularities of a plant varietal and understand what was the best uh, variety for a specific uh, for a specific effect, like if we were looking at productivity in areas where there was water um, scarcity or, and so when it becomes something that helps the farmer also find the best variety for his own uh, conditions, I find this an excellent alliance, but this is where I believe that it needs to be an alliance. Um, when we work in silos, so we have the farmers on one side that are uh, taking the plant varieties, or in the other case, uh, uh, using the... Right. Yeah, okay. So you didn't care, obviously. Pardon? Someone was not muted, I think. Okay. Sorry, I also have people walking into my office. <laughs> it's, it's, Go on. <laughs> it's, the beauty of being actually at the farm is that I don't have the quiet of, uh, of Rome. Um, so I was saying, it, it's, I really believe that now that we are at a breaking point, let's say, where we are putting a lot of things on the table. So how do we make European agriculture more sustainable towards the environment, towards civil society, giving us um, safe, healthy, sufficient products? We do it by rebalancing the whole relationship. And this is where I was saying that whole knowledge gap that there is between the farming community at, at really at local level and the world of plant breeders and the world of research. And, and now that we have new, even more uh, mind blowing technology coming into place that can really help us solve very local and very specific problems. That is where I believe that this is a, a, an excellent, this is a breaking point, but an excellent one, because if we build it on a relationship of trust where everyone in the value chain, including the researchers and, and the plant breeders and um, work together and not just basically as if it were a, just a commercial relationship where I'm selling you something, uh, then I really think that this is, this is the right path to reshape 
uh, the EU agricultural system in general. Thanks, Diana. That's a good point. Um, in view of the time, I will move on to our last topic for now, and then afterwards the, the floor is open for questions from the audience, so you can already start thinking about it. But before we open the floor, I want to go back to Martin, um, because you're an expert at, uh, at uh, gene banks. So okay, I think we all know and understand it, but can you explain why we need gene banks and why uh, biodiversity is so important? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I think we all agree, we we all agree that uh, agrobiodiversity is extremely important uh, uh, to ensure uh, food supply, food security uh, uh, for the world, in the, in the view of population growth and especially climate change. Uh, suitability of uh, plant varieties, even of crops, will will shift due to climate change. Uh, new uh, pest diseases will appear, so it will be uh, it will be important to continuously adapt, adapt the crops to the, to the new situation, to the new climate situation. And for that, it's important to have an important, to have a, a large pool of biodiversity to, 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 to get your new properties from. And so well, in, in the conservation of biodiversity, uh, usually distinction made between ex situ conservation, which is conservation of material outside natural conditions, and in situ conservation and on farm conservation, which is uh, conservation in natural conditions or in farmers' fields. And what gene banks do is they, they especially focus on this ex situ conservation and they uh, usually they keep uh, seeds of crops and they, they, they keep them under controlled conditions. And in this way, they, 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 they fix the biodiversity which is present and, uh, well, uh, whereas in case of in situ conservation, uh, uh, biodiversity may disappear because of climate change, because uh, a certain area is not suitable anymore for a crop. Uh, in ex situ conservation, this biodiversity will be pre will be preserved. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, well, I see, and of course, Gen GMAX not only uh, are working on, on uh, the preservation, the conservation of the material, but they also uh, promoting the use of it because they 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 are exchanging the seeds with other gene banks and they are giving out the seeds to 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 breeders, to researchers, to NGOs. To farmers, so that, so that they can use uh, use these seeds. Uh, it's, it's it's not like a stamp collection. It's it's uh, an active collection which has to keep, be kept alive and which is continuously uh, being uh, distributed to, to to users. I wanted to ask you about that indeed, because uh, let's say I want to breed a uh, resistant potato plant, and we find that there is a Peruvian variety that is resistant to a particular disease, then it would not be as easy as just swooping in and taking this potato, right? You work on access and benefit sharing. We have the FAO, International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, long name. And uh, of course, we have the Nagoya Protocol. Can you share us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, what did this, this, this session, what this symposium is about IPR and uh, not, uh, not access and benefit sharing, but in fact, these, these, these two things are related. Uh, because, well, to put it simply, you can say that intellectual property rights, they concern uh, rights on products made on the basis of genetic resources, while ABS, access to benefit sharing, is concerned with rights on the genetic resources it themselves, so which are used for making these products. And, uh, well, that, uh, actually, the, 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 the ABS system has been developed uh, as a response to the increased role of, of uh, intellectual property rights in the, in, the, in the second half of the 20th century. And, uh, well, at a certain moment, the situation arose that products based on genetic sources were not freely available because they are protected by intellectual property rights, but the genetic sources which are used for making these products were freely available and well especially developing countries they they they, they were concerned about that and in this way the, the abs system was developed and well the, the nagoya protocol is the best known and the nagoya protocol is the is the default system for access and benefit sharing and basically the nagoya protocol prescribes that um countries have sovereign rights over the genetic resources and that when you want to go to a country to get uh, for instance this potato seed in peru you have to contact the Peruvian government and to ask for permission to, 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 to take these seeds and use them for your research. Well, uh, this system was, in the first instance, it was based on, it was mainly used for, uh, for uh, well, uh, pharmaceutical industry, for, for cosmetic industry, which went out to take one plant and uh, used it for research and made one product of it. 
But in the case of plant breeding, uh, often many plants from different uh, areas, they are combined into a new variety. So this bilateral system in which you have to go to every country to arrange your, uh, your, to arrange your permits is, is not very well suited for, for, for plant breeding. And uh, for that reason, the, the other, uh, uh, the treaty was a long name, was developed, the International Treaty on Plant and Resources, Food and Agriculture, which is usually <laughs> referred to as the International Treaty. And uh, in, in, in this system, there, there's not a, uh, you don't have to go to every country uh, separately to get the permission, but there's a kind of a, it's a kind of multilateral system. And on the basis of one standard contract, you can get access to a range of genetic resources and uh, it's, it's, it's much easier. But this, this, of course, the standard contract also has some, some implications for the, for the, for the intellectual property rights, because the, the if, you start, if you obtain this material in the facilitated way through the standard contract, then uh, you are not allowed to, 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 to place patents or to, well, you are allowed to place patents. You, you are not allowed to, to, to protect this material uh, without it being available for, for, for other users. So the material has to remain available for others. Yeah. On the other hand, if you make a new product on the basis of the genetic resources, you are allowed uh, to, 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 to place patents on it, but then you have to share, uh, share your benefits with the, with the, with the motor of the system. And then you don't have to share the benefits with the, every country where you obtained the material from, but you, there's a kind of international benefit sharing fund where you deposit the money, and this money is then used to, to finance projects in developing countries. Yeah. yeah, I'm a bit spoiled because we talked about this on Monday already, that you mentioned then that uh, if, if we get a patent on a product that we got through the treaty, then you have to pay a monetary compensation to the country of origin because you take that kind of variation off the market, if I um, say it correctly. And then if you create a new plant variety, that's still available for the public to be used in other crosses. Uh, you, can, you cannot, you can, uh, through, this, uh, through this international treaty, you cannot take uh, uh, diversity from the market. Mm -hmm. The material itself and the properties within the material, you cannot, you cannot uh, patent it. So if you, if you uh, get this material, this is the material from Peru, and you you use the, this gene which confers the, the resistance, and you put it in a new variety. You cannot. Uh, you can. You can. You of course you can predict this variety, but you cannot uh, patent this property hmm. because it's 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 from a natural source, and it's 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 not patentable. So you're not allowed to do that under the, this contract. Okay. Okay. Of course, the, the the whole new variety you can protect, but not this specific property. Yeah. So let's say we would make this resistant gene in a plant variety, then it is possible to patent, patent it, but not the original plant. This is Even this property, you cannot patent property. it. No, okay. no. Okay, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, that, that was kind of the moderated session. I would uh, like to hear some questions from the audience now. In case you have any uh, questions, we have a very um, nice panel for you with many different viewpoints. Uh, so, if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, stand. Um, uh, before you ask your question, please introduce yourself, mention to who you want a question to be directed to, and then ask the question. Who wants okay. to start? There is a question online, so maybe I can read we it can out start loud. Online. Uh, Louisa says, uh, thanks a lot for everyone's interesting input. I'm a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research in Cologne, Germany. I have a question for Diana and Sonia. How can breeders trace back and benefit from patented varieties? Uh, for example, which have only small indels derived from CRISPR once they are grown outdoors and might cross out with adjacent other varieties. And how is this regulated, controlled in the EU at the moment? Who wants to answer that question first? I would say it's more for Sonia. I would. Yeah, Sonia. I can try, but I need some clarification. I'm sorry about that, what indels are. Can you repeat the question, Patricia? So the question was, uh, how can breeders trace back and benefit from patented varieties, for example, which have only small indels 
small nucleotide changes in the DNA derived from CRISPR once they are grown outdoors and might cross out with adjacent other varieties and how it is regulated, controlled in the EU at the moment. Yeah, okay, so you make a mutation, it gets outcrossed, so you can't really trace back anymore. <coughs> Where did this mutation come from? That's the question, right? Yeah, that's a good question. That's what, I, that's what I understood yep. as well, yes, okay. Thank you for the clarification. So, well, I think that there are maybe two sides to the question as, as I interpret it. Um, because you might want to ask it from the point of view of the breeder who has the patent, and also from the point of view of the breeder who wants to use the material. Um, how can you trace things actually? So the, the, the one, I guess, is more in the question here, uh, the one who would have the patent on a, on a specific trait. Um, yeah, how can they trace whether it's there? As I said, I'm only a lawyer, I'm not a scientist, but I assume they have some uh, technologies, maybe some markers to trace uh, whether the trait is present in a, in a particular material then which, uh, which is used by a competitor to know whether the patent is being, um, I wouldn't say infringed, but whether the patented product is being used or not by a competitor. Um, it's not regulated, I would say. So uh, I, I don't think there is any regulation at the EU level on, uh, on how this can be traced because it's IP, it's a private right. So it is really for the IP holder to, to, to have a system uh, whereby they can trace whether their patented innovation is within a material that is being used by a competitor or not. I don't know if that, uh, that answers the question. Uh, from, from the side of the breeders who would want to use material, um, how can they know whether something is falling under patent protection or not? Um, it's a difficult uh, thing to know, actually, because um, breeders are not used to reading patent claims. Patent claims can be very difficult to understand and can be very even more difficult to be able to um, to try to match it with varieties. So to know whether in a particular variety the patented or the claimed invention is actually present or not. So normally, um, um, yeah, some bigger companies might have people in-house who can do this kind of uh, so-called FTO, freedom to operate searches, but uh, obviously smaller companies don't have that capacity. So uh, they are in trouble because they, they, they really uh, don't know. So either they risk or they avoid the material. So those are the two strategies that you can have. Um, but what we try to do in order to facilitate uh, things, especially for smaller breeders to increase transparency, we created a database, which is called uh, Pinto. It's Patent Information and Transparency Online. It's a public database that we, are, um, that we set up and we are running as Euroseed, where actually the companies who have patents uh, on some particular characteristics, which are in commercial varieties, they provide information on the commercial varieties which contain the patented element. So yeah. it's, it's really public in public database, anybody can have a look. So it helps the breeders to quite a large extent to already have an initial source of information whether the particular variety might be patented or not. Yeah, so basically before Pinto, if I go to the supermarket and buy a tomato to grow my own plants, I would have no idea if there are any patents uh, or plant breeders rights on it. But in the Pinto database, I would be at least kind of able to search for a particular trait or uh, patents on this particular tomato, right? Yes, yes, but I have to add that Pinto is a, is a database on voluntary basis. So yes. you, should, you should never take it for granted that if something is not there, then it's not patented. Uh, because of course, it's only uh, on, on, on the voluntary um, decision of companies to contribute. For the time being, all our members contribute. So all the companies who are members of Eurocis provide information on their uh, varieties, which are covered by patents. But you also have to know that it's not only breeding, breeding companies who might have patents. And uh, for the time being, we don't have information from other potential patent holders. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, speaking about the technical limitations of detecting if, where the mutation came from, uh, Richard, maybe you can shed some light on that. Would it be possible if we make a CRISPR mutation and it outcrosses into the wild and I take that wild plant, is it then possible that we can trace back where that mutation came from? Um, well, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, that's one of the, the issues with the whole CRISPR-Cas discussion that uh, if you do a, a mutation, a normal uh, gene knockout, then it might have been arisen by EMS or by natural mutation or, what, or by CRISPR-Cas. So only if you tell what you have done, you can say, okay, this was uh, under the European law still GM or exempted because it was a natural mutation. Yeah. So you cannot trace it back. In the beginning of the crispr cas there were even people who said, okay, uh, put a flag on it so that you can identify your crispr cas uh, mutation. But that, that's, of course, a bit weird. Yeah. A very nice technique, which is clean, and then you're going to add something in order to be able to, to trace it. So yeah. yeah, you mean like put a signature mutations in your... Yeah, or, or uh, yeah, a kind yeah. of DNA sequence which you can do, and then you can develop a PCR, and then you know oh, this yeah. was a gene-edited product. Yeah. But as long as you don't put a signature in it, it could even be possible that two companies at the same time make exactly the same mutation. You have no idea who is the... Yeah, and one could say this is was my gene editing and the other could say, well, this is a natural mutation. Yeah, yeah, nobody... And would. only if, if a disgruntled uh, employee goes to the police and says, well, I know what they've done, <laughs> then uh, yeah. it might go differently. But yeah. otherwise, yeah, it's yeah. very difficult. Yeah, but I guess it would also be very risky for a company to try that. Yeah, and of course, and so I don't think that the companies will do that. But uh, I mean, yeah, the same holds true with all the different countries around us where there is now exemption of different types of gene editing. If that enters into the harbor of Rotterdam, well, okay, how are we going to check that? We yeah. Cannot. yeah, yeah, that's indeed a question for a different panel. I know that there's a lot of work being done on that as well. Um, any other questions from the audience or online? We have one question here. The microphone is on your way. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I can add uh, something because there, is a, there was a talk about why uh, pa plant breeders' rights and why patents mm -hmm. uh, and, and why plant breeders' rights are done because it's, it costs money, etc. But I think you should realize that uh, a patent is, well, at least 10, if not much more expensive than a, than a plant breeders' rights because let's say a thousand euros to, to start and then a fee per year, then you can have your variety. And there are a lot of breeders, especially in ornamentals, who like to have a variety with their name as a variety protected. So yeah, they do that and they do that for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the money aspect between patents and uh, plant breeders' rights is also very important. Yeah, good, good point. All right. Question. Yeah, so my name is Jonathan. I'm uh, studying uh, here at uh, Wageningen, Master of uh, Plant Sciences. I have a question for Diana. Um, you said that you're representing a, a large group of farmers with very diverse systems, cropping systems, uh, uh, environments. And uh, do you feel that current varieties and the varieties are available or how they are being utilized are limiting to this diverse set of uh, 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 systems or uh, or is that sufficient or should there be a change in that way so your question is basically is there enough variation on the market that you can choose from or is it too limiting yeah exactly yeah. and for example with these more diverse systems exactly i can imagine that there's some yeah. way that they can be utilized better yeah diana uh very good question and i'll probably ask my members next time i see them i would say that in general the feeling is that uh right now there is the sufficient amount necessary for the job that had to be done up till now um what i see is that in the years to come we will have to change a lot of the ways that so far have been uh, utilized uh we will have probably less plant protection products available on the market. We will have a constant challenging uh, climate system that is going to be very um, stressful uh, on the agricultural system in general. And I believe that we will have a uh, even more challenging and in a, and I believe in a solid and, and correct way uh, problem with 
the final consumer and the final customer and so with civil society in general at large. And so if I look at the future, I believe that instead we are probably in a, in a situation of scarcity of solutions and of alternatives. Um, so while we go looking for alternative production systems, probably alternative crops uh, what could have been grown in certain soils up to yesterday will probably not be what will be grown in, in five, 10 years. Well, as we go through this big process of adaptation and as I said, of reshaping, I believe that we will need more alternatives. And that is why we need even the way that alternatives come into the market to be um, fair, to be transparent and to, again, kind of level the playing field and not always kind of squeeze the farmer into a um, taker position, maybe even here in, the, in terms of what varieties we can use and what the market provides and what the industry provides. Um, so I feel we're at a good point, but especially this is the moment when we have to give a new direction to where we go in the future. Thank you, Diana. Any other questions? I think I saw something pop up online, but is there anything right now in the audience? Then we can maybe move to the online question. Yeah. And then I'll read out the, the online question. Um, it's from Manash and she's a, I hope it's she, uh, is a co-founder of uh, Viridin Seeds. It's an Irish company focusing on uh, legume improvement using um, mutagenesis tilling method. Um, yeah, and tilling is a high throughput mutation breeding uh, using EMS chemicals. And her question is towards Yolanda um, on EDV. And uh, yeah, it says, so I mutagenesis a commercial variety that I bought from store and cross it to my own germplasm. Is this still EDF uh, or EDV, sorry? Is there a definition about say less than 50% genome similarity to original parent um, is that then the EDV or not? I'm sequencing the parents and my lines and showing that they are different now. That's a quite broad question, but I think <laughs> it's kind of, so they have a variety from a company, they do EMS, but then they also cross it with their own variety, they sequence and they show that it's whatever percentage is the same, right? Okay, y Yolanda. Um, thank you, Manash, for the question. Um, I cannot comment on a particular case, as you can imagine, because it's a matter of um, breeders' rights and potential enforcement of breeders' rights. But uh, what I could share with you is that um, even in 91, the UPOF Convention already explained the methods that could be used to obtain essentially derived varieties. So, for example, a selection of a natural or induced mutant or of a somewhat clonal variant the selection of a variant individual from plants of the initial variety, but crossing or transformation by generic, genetic engineering. Those were just examples of different methods that it is possible to obtain an essentially derived variety. So this is why now with new breeding techniques and other breeding methods that are being developed in the future. So it may be important to clarify the three elements that would be key to arrive an initial assessment whether you are in front of an EDV or not will be first whether that variety is predominantly derived from another variety. And in relation to your question on the percentage, uh, there's some work that has been done by international um, breeders associations, and maybe uh, Sonia can develop a little bit on that. I know the International Seed Federation has developed some guidelines that can recommendations because at the end it's a matter between breeders to reach agreement whether there is predominant derivation or not. And when it, there is some evidence, whether through molecular techniques or other techniques, that a variety is predominantly derived, like a very high percentage from another variety, one single variety, then the question is whether it retains or not the essential characteristics of the initial variety. That's the other element. And this, you know, there is another matter that gets into the picture is that you need to remove the characteristics that are come from the I thought the actual method of, of um, the method of um, uh, the act of derivation. So that means if in the act of derivation, let's say through the mutation, there is already 
some change in characteristics, maybe even an apple could be a change of color of the apple fruit, that change in characteristics should be disregarded because those differences come from the act of derivation. So as you see, it's a complex matter. And in addition, the essentially derived variety needs to be clearly distinguishable from the initial protected variety. So if you match the three, then you have an EDB. But in any case, I think the key element is that through molecular techniques, through different methods, it's possible to already assess or not whether there is predominant derivation. And that's the moment where maybe the, the relevant parties need to sit in the table and find some common agreement on how to commercialize the, the new variety that may come up from, um, from using these uh, methods. So I don't know whether, Sonia, you would like to add something. And I was just um, maybe checking whether you can share a little bit more what the breeders are doing to organize themselves and to pry for the clarity in relation to- I, I, would, I would first like to yes. come back to the apple because I didn't get that. And I think uh, I saw some confused faces. So if you have an apple with a different color, did you say that is already enough as a new variety or not yet? Okay, uh, maybe I go a little bit back. Uh, uh, and I would like to know if there is an apple breeding uh, of breeders in the room, please uh, help and support or clarify. But uh, for example, when you are you know, working on absolutely new genetics of new apple variety, normally you will use a diversity of uh, material, a diversity of um, you know, um, apple varieties. It may take even in some cases up to 10 to 25 years, even to, to come with this new, new, really new genetics of an apple variety. But it is also possible, imagine that after that period, you result in this very good uh, commercial apple variety that is protected, commercialized, and from that protected variety, through new breeding techniques, uh, you may be able to make some changes that also would be maybe attractive to the market, you know, like the Arctic apple, you know, with the browning that did. And then it may be possible even to protect that variety where you have used just one single variety in your breeding program and obtain something that is this, you know, complies with the conditions of protection so you can protect it. If you can prove that that variety is an essentially the right variety, then the breeder of the initial protected variety will have you know, a space to negotiate with that uh, other um, uh, company that has developed the, uh, the, um, the variety with these changes and be able to get an agreement in order to commercialize the essentially the right variety. The challenge is that, as I said, you need to comply with the three elements of the definition of essentially the right variety, predominantly derived, clearly distinguishable, and uh, conformity on the essential characteristics. But that element of conformity of essential characteristics, you need to disregard the difference in characteristics that result from the act of derivation. So in the example I gave before, if the actual change of the color of the apple fruit comes from the act of derivation, it means the mutation, then that change in the color will not be considered to be essential characteristics because it comes from the act of derivation. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky yeah, situation. It's, it's case by case. Yeah. So yeah, things will need to be analyzed. And I think breeders know among themselves and companies know whether they are you know, developing essentially the right variety or not. And the question is whether there is clarity on the concept for the ones who need to reach agreement, they do it as early as possible. And they may even give cross licenses, you know, between yeah. the two, the breeder of the initial protected variety and the breeder of the essentially derived variety, because there may be commercial um, advantages for, for the two parties. Yeah, so that, that brings me then to Sonia. So there is act, uh, active, um, uh, not negotiations, but the industry is working towards making this easier. Then. Yeah, what, what the industry has done, um, or started doing uh, for, for a couple of crops where, where EDVs might uh, occur more often uh, is to come together and try to set um, an, in, uh, uh, an accepted EDV threshold, accepted meaning accepted by the industry. So accepted within the, within the members of the International Seed Federation, which is the worldwide organization uh, or, or association of uh, breeders. So um, in a number of crops, 
the International Seed Federation uh, has come to conclusion on such uh, EDV thresholds. Um, I cannot, re I don't have the, the, the crops um, in the top of my head, but we have done the same at the European level for potatoes uh, to, to really set what would be the, the so-called uh, accepted EDV threshold, which means that if the, 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 the genetic similarity um, between the initial variety and the alleged EDV is higher, then the threshold which has been uh, set by the industry as the accepted uh, threshold for EDVs, uh, then it would kind of um, reverse the burden of proof from our point of view. So um, if then the, the it's, it's proven that the genetic similarity is higher than the threshold, then the breeder of the alleged EDV would need to prove that it's not an EDV. Okay, thank you. Elena, did I see that you had a question? Yeah, I, I have a question. And is it enough yeah, close? Yeah, okay. You. Uh, it's about the farmer's privilege. And it is uh, then maybe for uh, Diana. And it is um, then about farmer saved seed and that practice related with the uh, plant breeders' rights. And um, well, the question first is if farmers want to save their seeds. Um, and what are um, then maybe, this is also maybe uh, for Yolanda, what are the legal challenges related to uh, farmer safety seed practices? Thank you. Thank you. Diana? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, I was thinking... <laughs> Having to admit, again, my incapacity to answer for all farmers, um, I'll, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll use, let's say, my example. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wine grower from Tuscany, and uh, for many years I've been studying our vineyards and kind of analyzing the way that they, uh, they've changed, they've adapted to our soil, to our uh, climate conditions that uh, and also I have seen how the industry has changed the varieties that have been uh, used in the vineyards we replanted. So I started studying side by side the vineyards that had been planted, let's say in 2005 and 2008 with varieties of Sangiovese that had been really constructed to give a more giving product, something that had uh, stronger tannins, deeper color, uh, that really had a, a polyphenolic structure that was very different from the typical Sangiovese that was being grown in the Chianti Classico region, that in its history had been uh, blended with other varieties because it was missing some uh, particularities such as color. Uh, in the old days, you would add Colorino, which is a varietal that has a, a tinting uh, it has um, a red pulp rather than color molecules only on the skins. And they would use this colorino to give Sangiovese and Chianti Classico color. Now you have a Sangiovese varietal that instead has much more antichanos and so much more color molecules and so doesn't need this colorino as much. But in my case, what I was noticing that this advancement that we were getting was in a way taking us away from what was the tradition of the of the wine culture here. No, Chianti Classico is a very small DOCG, a very historical one, one that has been defined for doing quality wines since the 1700s and that had this history. And so for me, the idea that the industry was giving us something that was already solving some of our initial product problems, but that the initial problem problems had been solved by the history of the denomination through blending made me feel uncomfortable with the direction that the industry was pushing me in, if that makes sense. So for example, what we did, we took our own cuttings from our own plants for about four years and regrafted them in order to bring that genetic material into our own plants. But this was for then me impossible to state because of all the rules and regulations on plant breeding. And uh, so this was, as I said, it was done a bit in the Italian style. You just kind of do it and hope that nobody will ever come and question you too much about it. 
Um, but for me, it was so maybe yes, there are farmers who actually have that sensibility, have that capacity to see something that is so uh, specific to their needs, to their conditions, to their desire on how they want to farm. And that is really relevant. It's not just being a stubborn farmer who's stuck in his own ways, that then instead the world of regulation doesn't help us um, kind of also be allowed to use that, that to move that desire in, also into a legal framework. Yep. Thank you. The second part of the question, Eleanor. What? Yep. Uh, Yolanda, do you want to add something for the legal challenges of farmers uh, reusing the seeds? I think after that answer, we also stop the question round. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the question. I mean, in our work in UPOV, we help countries to develop their legislation uh, in order to become UPOV members. And if there is one provision that is a very important provision and a challenge one to draft uh, is the one concerning farm CC. This is an optional exception under plant breeders' rights, and it is up to the legislator to include it in the national regional legislation. The majority of UPOV members, they do include that uh, exception, and it is adapted to the particular circumstances of the, the, the country and the objectives. The big challenge of this exception is that uh, it applies to the, those crops where there is a traditional practice of farmers of saving seed for the next season. So that means we are really talking here about a small grain cereals or potatoes, means that the, the variety, the propagating material has the capacity to when it's planted and you obtain the harvest, to the harvest as such to be uh, kept and conditioned as seed for the next season. So in general, there's no traditional practice of farmers, to my knowledge, uh, as in the UPO of guidance in relation to uh, fruit ornamentals and vegetables, because in general, you don't use as such the, the fruit or the, or, or the flower or the, um, or the vegetable as, um, as the basis for propagating purpose. You use other parts of the plant. So um, the big challenge at the policy level on finding the right balance between uh, the needs of farmers, because in a way, as it was mentioned today, farmers need constant flow of improved varieties. And, and that will only be possible if there is incentive for breeding in order to meet the needs of farmers with improved varieties that will meet their particular uh, conditions. So if you have a farm safe seed provision that is very wide, and there is no incentives going back to the breeder, then the whole plant breeder's right system will be empty and there will be no incentives and the farmers will be facing challenging situations if they cannot access, access these improved varieties. On the other hand, if you're not taking into consideration the practice of farmers of saving seed and the reasons they may have to, to save seed, sometimes because they are in remote locations, and they need quality, quality seed and the right time of the year at the right quantity. So that also will be a challenge. So normally there is a need to find a right balance. And in general, a lot of legislation, they exempt a small commercial farmers from paying remuneration back to the breeder for farm seed. But then the, uh, I would say the, um, the other commercial farmers, you know, large or middle commercial farmers, they do pay something back to the breeder for farm safe seed because they have interest to continue invest in this development of new varieties to meet their needs. Yeah. So this so is what I will say. Balance. Yeah, it's a careful balancing act, but it also depends on the crop and about the circumstances. Uh, in view of the time, Sonia, I'm really interested in your answer as well. I see you raise your hand. Uh, I would like to close the session in a few minutes, though, so please keep your answer short. Yes, yeah, sure. Now, I just wanted to add uh, something, if I may, on, on the farmer's privilege, because I think the question was also asking about legal challenges uh, for mm -hmm. farmers, but uh, I wanted to know that there are legal challenges for breeders as well in implementing this um, derogation from the right, I would say. Uh, and I just wanted to mention how it works in the EU legislation. So there is a regulation on plant variety protection in the EU where there is the privilege uh, which is provided um, where uh, farmers can reuse 
the product of the harvest in the next season um, on their own farms. And then they have to pay a remuneration to the breeder, which is at the minimum 50% of the royalty level, which would be the royalty on, on certified seed. So it's a lower level of royalty and then small form farmers don't have to pay. But the legal yeah. challenge is that the, there is no um, guarantee in the laws. There is no provision really, which allows breeders to know which farmers have used uh, farm safe seed of protected varieties. So it's very, very challenging for the breeders, at least in the EU, to, uh, to put in place systems whereby they can actually know who has been using farm safe seed of protected varieties and who they have to invoice to get yeah. the remuneration. So as Yolanda said, the balance is very important to still have the, the, the remuneration from the farmers also on the use of farm safe seed, but it's yeah. a very important legal challenge for the breeders to actually enforce their rights. So it is possible for a farmer to reuse their seeds as long as they pay 50%, I believe you said, of the mm -hmm. original cost. Uh, but it's difficult to enforce and maybe the Italian method is working in some cases uh, on that as well. Um, with that, I would like to close down our panel session. Uh, of course, I want to uh, give a big round of applause for all our panel members who were here today. And I think I also want to give Elena a big hand of applause because she arranged all the panel members. She made sure that we had the best people in this panel. So please give it up for Elena as well. And also thanks to the audience for all of your questions and for your interest in this topic. And with that, I close down this panel session. Uh, Patricia. Yeah, we are going to go for a short uh, break just to stretch our legs and then we are going to be back in the maximum 10 minutes for another very interesting talk so please don't leave people online people uh, uh, here in the room there's still one talk and after that there are drinks for people in person i'm sorry people online <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you very much yeah, yeah i do my best Okay, everyone, thanks for coming back. <laughs> So we still have one very interesting talk uh, given by Dr. Ruben van Heck, who also obtained his PhD from Wageningen University in Systems and Synthetic Biology. And then in 2017, well, he changed his uh, career path and became trainee patent attorney uh, at uh, EDP Patent Attorneys, where he still works uh, today as Dutch patent attorney. And he's gonna tell us something about his journey in a talk from scientist to patent attorney. So yeah, floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Pointer. That should be the pointer. Uh, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone, uh, also online. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this very nice event and also for the invitation to tell you all a bit about my journey from being a scientist to becoming a patent attorney. Um, in this talk, I'll also tell a bit about what I actually do as a patent attorney, and I'll touch very briefly on some aspects of the patenting of plants. And I will touch on a few things that were already discussed earlier today here, but that from a slightly different point of view. So starting with... Okay, 
starting with my uh, background. So I studied here in Wageningen. I did a bachelor in <clears throat> molecular life sciences, which is basically a combination of physics, chemistry, biology, a little bit of math, all applied to the molecular scale. I then went on to do a master's in bioinformatics, which is all about computational tools applied to biology with a focus on using genetic information to understand biological systems. I then went on to do a PhD at the Department of Systems and Synthetic Biology here in Wageningen, where I used mathematical models of metabolism of bacteria to try and well, better understand the metabolism of the bacteria, but also try and redesign it, re-engineer the bacteria. As a quick side note there, I'd like to mention, I was also involved in the iGEM competition, first as a participant, later as a supervisor and as a judge. And iGEM is a global competition on synthetic biology for students. And they have very long been active in uh, stimulating the social debate on new genetic technologies. And I think if you are interested in the application of genetic technologies and what can be done with them outside of the field of plants, you should really have a look because it's fascinating and very inspiring to see every year again what these students come up with. Now, after my PhD, I did a postdoc for a few months, basically to wrap up some of the things I was working on on my PhD and also to figure out what I wanted to do next. Now, for what I wanted to do next, I was really thinking about which parts of the academic work did I like, which part of the academic work did I not like so much, and how can I find a job that balances those in the right ways? So some of the things I really liked about academia is the fact that you work at the forefront of innovation. You're constantly encountering new problems, new challenges, you're learning new things, you're exploring, and it's very exciting to come up with new ideas and see how they pan out. Another aspect I liked is all the way the other side of a project where you actually have your results, you have your findings, you're looking to share those, to disseminate with the public, and finding the right words to convey what you've learned in a way that's concise and clear and also actually legible is something I always quite enjoyed. And I think most importantly, what I really liked about work in academia is that you get to work together with other people, other scientists, and scientists tend to be very passionate about what they do, and they care a lot. And there's, I think, nothing more motivating than working together with people who really care about solving a problem, working on that problem together. A few years earlier, one of my former colleagues had gone into patent law. And at the time when he was telling about it, I didn't really think much about it. But then when I was myself thinking about what do I want to do next, I kept coming back to this idea of maybe going into patent law because I figured that, well, you are still at the forefront of technology and uh, constantly being presented with things that by definition basically are new, um, where you get to well, learn new things, but also think along with inventors on how to actually approach their position. Um, as patent law is part a legal uh, procedure, um, I also figured that writing is very important there, trying to find the right ways to say exactly what you want and find the right definition. That's something I figured I'd be good at and that I'd enjoy. And where I thought scientists are enthusiastic, passionate people, I figured that Inventors, entrepreneurs are probably doubly so. So I thought that could be a fun crowd to work with as well. Now, so in 2017, I then noticed there was a position opening here in Wageningen at EDP Patent Attorneys. I applied, and then I started working there. Now, you might think that this is a bit of an unusual career move, an unusual career path, but actually in order to become a patent attorney in the Netherlands, you have to have a master's in a technical field. And although it is not a strict requirement, it is basically the norm that you also have a PhD. So among patent attorneys, my background is not very unique at all. Um, it's kind of the norm. The other requirements are to become a patent attorney are that you have to then get legal training, both in terms of general law, but also specifically focused on patent law, for which you have to then pass a bunch of exams. And you have to work under the mentorship of someone who is a qualified patent attorney for a number of years. And last year, I was sworn in as a Dutch patent attorney. Now, I also intend to become a European patent attorney. There's a few additional requirements there, one of them being that you have to pass the European qualifying examination, which is another bunch of uh, relatively tough exams. And I'm currently waiting on the outcome. So I hope to be able to call myself a European patent attorney later this year. Now, before I get into a bit of what I do, I want to talk about what a patent really is. And I was really doubting whether or not I should include this slide, given that I'm the last speaker at a symposium on plants and patents. Um, but I'm glad I kept it in, because I think what is at the core of a patent for me is that a patent is a deal between inventors at the one hand and society at the other hand, 
where the inventor provides knowledge. They provide information, how their invention works, what it can be applied for. And in return for that, they get the right from society to exclude others from commercially exploiting their invention. So we share, basically, we get knowledge as society and we give the right back, the patent right back to someone. And thereby, the patent system doesn't only stimulate innovation, but it also stimulates dissemination, the sharing of knowledge. Besides that, a patent is also a legal document on technical subject matter. In order to have a successful patent application, it really needs to be written by someone who both understands the legal considerations and the technical considerations. That is exactly what patent attorneys are for. Um, so at EDP patent attorneys, we are what's called outside counsel, meaning that we do not have inventors, researchers in-house, but we support other companies, other people in um, well, their patent rights and navigating the patent right of other parties. And this takes the form of um, legal advice. Um, we talked a bit earlier today about that patents are part of a business strategy. Uh, you can see probably in the top left corner of the slide there. Um, that's also our point of view. Uh, patents are always a element in a business strategy. So we always check first with our clients, um, do you actually want a patent? Maybe a plant breeder right would make more sense, uh, but maybe also keeping something secret would make more sense or just publishing it. And most common things that we discuss are patentability. Can a new development be patented, yes or no? Uh, freedom to operate. Is what you actually want to bring to market, is it possible? Or would you be infringing on someone else's patent right? And just general IP strategy. What is worth investing in? Which countries do you might you want to have a patent in? And how do you uh, keep track of what your competitors are doing? How do you navigate the rights that they have? And the other important aspect of our job is that we get to represent our clients in front of the patent offices. Important one for us here is the European Patent Office. And it's primarily in the context of what's called prosecution. A prosecution is everything from the filing of a patent application until its eventual grant or rejection. And it's not at all the case that if you file a patent application, that you'll ultimately get a patent. In fact, in the biotech sector, and plant biotechnology would fall in there, um, less than 30% of filed patents ultimately lead to a granted patent. In other fields of technology, all other fields of technology combined, this is closer to 50%. So getting a patent on a plant product is actually really hard. Uh, something that doesn't occur as often, but uh, as patent attorneys, we also get to represent clients in front of the court. That can be, for instance, when uh, a client has a patent and someone else is infringing on it, they want to start litigation. It can also be in the case that someone is waving around a patent and we think that should never have been granted in the first place, and we want to have it nullified. For the rest of this talk, I will focus on patentability and freedom to operate. These are typically the first things that people come to us for, and I think are also the most, um, well, say, most closest to, to most of you, most easy to understand. So uh, it was already mentioned by some of the previous speakers, but uh, patentability analysis often starts with what we call an invention disclosure form. This is essentially a document in which an inventor describes what they have invented, how it works, how it's different from everything that exists, why it's better, how it's going to change the world, etc. And I always find it very exciting when I get an invention disclosure form because it's an opportunity for me to learn something new and to well, explore a new topic. At this stage, we also always try to plan a face-to-face -face meeting with the inventors to discuss what they have. And I would say I was right in that inventors tend to be really enthusiastic, tends to be that the invention is, you know, their little baby, it's gonna change the world or their field, or at least their own lives, maybe wanna make a startup. And it's just energizing to work with people who feel that way. Now, the very first step is actually to find out what the invention is. And that might sound trivial, but often we find that it's not what the inventor thinks that the invention is. So to give an example, an inventor could come to us and say, I've developed a drone for monitoring plant growth, maybe specifically for monitoring potato growth. And then we ask, so why did you develop this drone? And they might tell us, well, there were no drones on the market that had the specific sensors that I need for my analysis. And if I wanted to buy those sensors, they weren't compatible with any of the drones in the market because they were much too, too heavy or too big or too energy intensive. And so I developed my own drone because there was nothing else available. And we think, okay, so the actual problem that you had was that the sensors that you wanted to use were too heavy and too big. 
and your invention isn't a drone for monitoring plant growth, but it's sensors that are smaller and lighter. You might use this in a drone for the specific application in mind, but maybe you could also use those in your smartphone or in a small airplane or something completely else entirely. Um, so we really look to try to see what the, the concept behind an invention is and how that could also be applied for in other areas. This also takes place uh, when we uh, get an invention disclosure from often very specific examples in there, or as we would call them, embodiments. But we try to find out what is the concept behind it all and how can we give one definition that encompasses all that the inventor has in mind, but probably also a bit more. When we know that, we will try to define the invention. This is what is called a patent claim. Uh, if you've ever read a patent application, at the end of the document, you'll see a few very long sentences. And these are essentially definitions of the invention, definitions of what, if the patent is granted, the scope of protection would be. And in this stage, we're not only thinking about what our inventors have developed, but also what would a competitor try to do if this would get protected? And can we maybe already take that into account when we define our claims as well? So we're also trying to think along and think of alternatives. Now these claims ultimately, in order to get a patent, have to be patentable. And this means they have to be novel, they have to be inventive, and they have to be industrially applicable. Now novelty in this context means that the claim cannot cover anything that already existed before. Anything that's covered before is not novel, therefore not patentable. Inventive step means that the subject matter and covered by the claim has to have a technical effect over what existed before. It has to basically means there has to be a technical benefit that was non-obvious based on everything that was known before. <laughs> Industrial applicability is a little bit of a wash, um, but it basically means it has to be producible or usable in industry, which specifically includes agriculture. Now, novelty and inventive step are seen relative to what is known as the prior art. And what is prior art? Well, it's basically all information made available to the public by anyone that includes the inventors themselves in any form before the filing date of the patent application. Now, that's a bit abstract. Some very typical examples are the scientific literature and other patent applications. And the language of these documents is completely irrelevant. In theory, also a clay tablet from a language that nobody reads anymore, nobody speaks, could be prior art. Also oral presentations, poster presentations are prior art. If you are in a train in Japan, you're discussing an idea you have in English with a friend, and there's nobody around you that speaks English, technically that conversation is still prior art because you discussed it in public. In fact, even a cartoon can be prior art. What we're seeing in this cartoon is uh, Donald Duck with his uh, nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And um, they're trying to get a sunken boat back to the surface. And they're doing this by injecting it with uh, ping pong balls, which are buoyant. They have increasing the buoyancy of the vessel, which then slowly rises to the surface. And as it turns out, or as the story goes, a few years later, someone tried to patent a method of raising a sunken or stranded vessel by introducing buoyant bodies into the interior of the vessel. And so the patent examiner said, very nice, but Donald Duck already did it, so it's not patentable. Okay. So I talked a bit about novelty and inventive step and industrial applicability, which are the main criteria for patentability, but there are also exclusions to patentability. One of these, according to Article 53B and Rule 28.2 of the European Patent Convention, are that European patents shall not be granted in respect of plant varieties, essentially biological processes for the production of plants, and plants exclusively obtained by means of an essentially biological process. Now, the plant varieties part covers what is basically covered by the breeder's rights. So there is an alternative form of intellectual property for plant varieties. So therefore, you cannot patent them. And the part for essentially biological processes and plants derived therefrom basically covers that according to the biotech directive that was mentioned earlier today. These are not patentable. Moving on from patentability analysis. Oh, no, wait, one more. Um, yes, yeah, so methods for providing plants with new genomic techniques or new plant breeding techniques um, and with plants and plant products resulting therefrom are in principle not excluded from patentability. In principle, any exclusion or any 
uh, exception in law should be explained narrowly as a general rule. These things are not covered in the European Bad Convention. They're not covered by the exception of Article 53B. So in principle, they are patentable. So if you develop a plant uh, with CRISPR technologies and a plant has an increased drought resistance, so to say, um, that in principle is patentable. So going to now actually going to the next topic, freedom to operate. Um, so freedom to operate means that the product that you are trying to bring to market is not covered by anyone else's patent right. If any patent right covers your product, then you do not have freedom to operate. So an example could be right, that someone comes to us and say, do we have freedom to operate for selling our fertilizer? But there's two main things that we need to do at this stage is what is actually in your fertilizer, which compounds, let's call them A, B, and C, and where are you looking to actually sell? Because patents are territorial rights. So if you want to sell something in the Netherlands and Germany, then it doesn't matter at all if someone has a patent on that in China or Australia. Once we know that, um, we're going to then search for patents and patent applications because they may be granted later that would essentially cover this fertilizer. So some examples, we could find a patent that is on a composition comprising compounds A, B, C, and D. Now, given that this patent claims a composition that contains D and that our fertilizer does not contain D, the fertilizer is not covered by this patent. So it would be freedom to operate relative to this document. If instead there would be a patent on a composition comprising A and B, then the even though it's not called a fertilizer, um, our fertilizer does contain A and B. So in principle is a composition comprising A and B and thus would be covered by this patent. Similarly, if there would be a patent on compound C, then uh, this patent would cover the fertilizer comprising A, B, and C. Now a suggestion that people often make if they in a situation like this, is that, well, what if we ourselves then patent the combination A, B, and C for fertilizer? Because these three compounds together work much better than if you only have A and B, or if you have A, B, C, and D. It's very surprising. Well, that unfortunately doesn't work. Um, mentioned before, a patent gives you the right to exclude others from commercially exploiting an invention. It does not give you the right to exploit your invention yourself. So in that case, well, you would have a patent. Um, yeah, I should do it there probably. You would have a patent, but your competitor's patent would encompass it. So you still don't have freedom to operate if you don't arrange a license with them. Another situation that could occur is that you and your competitor both have rights, but they overlap somewhere. And in the overlapping space, if you don't arrange license with another, you cannot commercialize the products that fall there. So to briefly summarize, um, a few years ago, I made a transition from being a researcher into being a patent attorney. Uh, if you couldn't tell from the presentation yet, I'm thoroughly enjoying being a patent attorney because I get to work with motivated people, brilliant people on new technologies. I get to think along, I get to be creative in thinking and writing, and I get to play with, with words and play with rules in order to try and get the best protection for our clients. And with that, I wish to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ruben, for your talk. Are there any questions for him here in person? Thanks, Ruben. I have, uh, well, a few questions, but I'll start with one. So you mentioned that only 30% of the file patents actually get granted in agriculture. Is there a reason why it's so low? It's in, in biotechnology at large. Um, there's a few reasons. I think that it's a relatively unclear space because of the exceptions and because of the overlap with readers' rights on what can actually be patented or not. Um, there also is a higher bar for proof. If you have an invention that really just relies on Newtonian physics, then you don't really need a lot of experimental proof because people will look at it and say, yeah, that should work. Um, but if you have an invention that relies on a transgender gene, um, people aren't gonna believe you if you don't show the data, right? So there's a higher bar for proof. Um, and there's also a few peculiarities when it comes to biotechnology. You have to provide sequence listings and you have to, in some cases, make biological deposits of your bacteria, fungi, whatever, uh, to give others access to the material so they can um, well, reproduce your invention. Inventions have to be enabled. So there's a few extra hurdles in biotechnology um, that don't exist in other fields. There is one question uh, online asking, 
for being a patent attorney, is having a PhD necessary? And are companies more interested in training PhDs? Um, it is not necessary. Um, it is a bit of the norm, but it's definitely not necessary. It depends a bit on which field you're in. So in life sciences, I think that the, really the majority of patent attorneys has a PhD. Um, but if you go for more classical engineering, for example, then it's much less. But it's, it's not a requirement. It just depends on the, on the company that they will hire. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hi. Uh, so someone else during previous uh, presentation, I'm not sure who it was again, uh, mentioned that in the US you have uh, certain breed, seed breeding companies that both patent and uh, uh, go through the plant breeding rights uh, system. So then certain varieties have both. Uh, doesn't that then cancel out certain uh, things that you just discussed in the sense that, th that they can cover each other? And how does that also work when you would your sort of use a variety in Europe then or as a seed breeder? For example? I'm not intimately familiar with breeder rights or with the exact situation in the US. Um, what I can say is that a variety can, it, you can't, can't patent a variety as such, but if you would have an improvement that would work on, say, all tomato plants, then you could patent that, and then people within that scope can make plant varieties. Um, so there, there can be overlapping patent rights and plant variety rights in Europe as well. You simply cannot have the exact same scope with a patent right that you could have with a breeder's right. Uh, a nice introduction into the patent attorney. I actually wondering um, in your job, for example, you are you you are studying very specific on a certain topic in your PhD and your master, right? But at the moment, do you also have to learn a lot of uh, new technology in a different field? Yeah, yeah. So I think in my current job, I I get a lot of uh, value from my bachelor's degree actually because that is a bit of physics a bit of chemistry a bit of biology and it lays a very strong broad foundation um, but in my job yes i will need to understand the invention uh, irrespective of what field it's from um, the good thing is there's always an inventor at hand who is an expert in that field and so if i have any questions i can ask Uh, I have a question. Um, it, concerns, it concerns something that uh, I have not um, often, it has not been so clear to me, uh, which is the fact that sometimes um, I've heard people asking that sometimes if patent cases formalize um, a patented technology and, that in, and then in the field it doesn't work as they expected it, uh, then actually it's disconnected. Uh, say, but this has always been a bit confusing for me since uh, patents per se legally are only exclusive rights for commercialization that do not, um, well, they are not guarantees that actually something will, will work in the field. But maybe that is more a point, a point of, uh, well, the legal framework about liability and how that works in court and how patents maybe get entangled into that. Is that something connected with your work at all? And maybe, I don't know, can you just explain how it relates? Yeah, so a patent has to be enabled on its day of filing. This also means that someone else reading the patent document should be able to reproduce the invention. That is a requirement for patenting. So if invention cannot be reproduced based on the disclosure of the patent document, then the person or the company holding the patent document should never have gotten it in the first place. So this can be grounds for having the patent nullified. Now, if a patent is nullified, uh, it could be that um, if they have used it before to prevent other parties from doing something, maybe the company that was now trying to um, reproduce the technology, that there could be liabilities in there because they were enforcing a right that they should never have had in the first place. I hope that broadly answers your... Uh, yeah. There is one question online. Uh, does the increase of patents through new breeding techniques decrease the versatility of the breeder's rights? How can this be avoided? Does the increase in patents of new breeding techniques decrease the versatility of... Um, breeder's rights. 
Um, I think to some extent, uh, there's, there's a new technology on the market and that is going to cause some change in the field. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily on the, on the patents itself. Um, I also think that doesn't necessarily need to be avoided. The patent rights and breeders' rights are both alternative forms of intellectual property to uh, stimulate the innovation in, well, in this case, uh, plant science and to make improved products available to us. So I think it doesn't, my personal view is it doesn't necessarily matter if a development is going to get covered by a plant variety, uh, right, or going to get protected via a patent right. I think it's important that there is a form of intellectual property that rewards the person developing this improvement for their work. Not an entire answer to the question, but. Well, I hope that the person at home is happy with the answer. And uh, there is also one more uh, question. Can you share your view, if you have one, on this whole, uh, well, CRISPR patent rights going from Berkeley and Jennifer Doudna to MIT? I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about the entire legal battle to really go into that. Um, so I, I don't think I can give a, a good, clear answer on it. It's a very complicated struggle. And then just one short question. What would be the ideal path for someone with masters in plant breeding to become a patent attorney? Um, I mean, if you want to strengthen your, your resume for becoming a patent attorney, then already doing courses on IP uh, would probably help. Uh, I should also consider, do I want to be a patent attorney in-house at a company? Because then you can really remain focused on the specific avenue you're on. If you want to be a patent attorney uh, as outside counsel, you might want to try and broaden your horizon a bit. Um, it's all about being you know, the most interesting candidate for the position, ultimately. Well, thank you, Ruben. And uh, with that, I will close this uh, question session and give it up to Elena for closing remarks. Well, first, I would like really to thank you all for attending today. I think, I think plants and patents was a weird and very controversial conundrum to try to target today. I hope that uh, today uh, the, the different speakers showed a bit how fascinating also it could be, and not only controversial in many aspects, how it is a complex web of uh, interests. Yes, also legal basis, but also actually stakeholders, huh? interested people that are doing interesting things from researchers to farmers as well and how for say it is an ecosystem of these players and uh, what we were also interested maybe to give a bit of a sense of is that it is an ecosystem that right now maybe possibly with the advent of NGTs that we are following quite eagerly uh, politically at Gene Sprout this ecosystem might change uh, we don't know we have discussed it a little bit uh, but that us as young plant scientists or like plant scientists as well and different actors, uh, we can do something to follow up, to inform ourselves and to understand. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think also just discussing these topics can create a lot of impact in establishing trust in seeing, also just exploring. We saw that um, we, should, we shouldn't work in silos, uh, Diana said, and I think that's extremely important to expose these topics. Yes, they are difficult, but they're interesting and they can be accessible. I think this could be a great ground to, to establish new collaborations in society and with science and entrepreneurship. And so yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, it has been a pleasure to organize this. So. There are the drinks right now downstairs. <laughs>